Hey friends, I'm Scott Hanselman. We're here at Microsoft Virtual Academy and we are going to talk about Identity Server. We've got Brock Allen from IdentityServer.io. We're going to learn all about this great open source OpenID Connect and OAuth 2.0 framework for .NET and uh, we'll build an application. We'll do some real authentication today. Yep. Thanks for coming. Yep, thanks for having me. All right, so let's take a look at your uh, browser here. You're in IdentityServer.io. This yep. is the home page for your, uh, your product, your open source product. Yep. So yeah, so um, we, uh, well, my colleague and I, Dominic, he and I have been working on Identity Server for, for many years and have had many um, versions and evolutions over the time. Mm -hmm. um, and we are trying to help uh, allow customers to build um, a what's called a security token service. This has to do with doing um, authentication and web API security within your application um, sort of ecosystem. Okay, so like right now when we see hello world examples, I go file a new project, file a new project, and I just end up having my web API call other web APIs. Web APIs. It's usually no security at all. Right. Well, um, yeah, in file new project, yeah, maybe by default there's no security enabled, but that's absolutely something you have to think about, mm -hmm. and you have to architect into your into your application ecosystem. Um, and so, you know, of course, security is a huge, huge topic that's um, important for everyone to, to get right. Mm -hmm. So that's, again, another thing that we're trying to help with. Well, and even worse, I've seen people just roll their own security where they'll have, <laughs> like, well, just use this HTTP header. Right. We'll have keys that we'll put right. in a table. And right. then we'll just revoke the keys if there's a problem. Right. And so uh, I suppose you could roll things like that, but you're building and inventing your own security. Mm -hmm. um, we're focused on these protocols called OpenID Connect and OAuth 2. Mm -hmm. And the idea with these things is that these are protocols that are um, developed by a large number of people, really smart people who know about attacks and, and um, you know, they think about these problems. And then there's a larger group um, of people who then read the specifications mm -hmm. and they try to poke holes in it to find vulnerabilities or whatever. And so um, you have a lot of eyes on the specs to help make sure that you know if um, there's a problem with it, it's going to get it you know fixed and and some you know we're going to have a, a solution to that security problem. If you roll your own, you know no guarantees that you have enough people looking at it. Cool. Except makes maybe sense. The, except maybe the bad guys. So it makes sense. I should not be rolling my own. Typically, if you're writing an application, unless it's the next great identity server, right. then you should just use uh, some of the good open source protocols and applications that yes. already exist. Cool. Um, so, can I give you like a little bit of overview of the the, the, the problem space that we're trying to, to address here? So, um, this is the identityserver.io website, just a bunch of information about Identity Server. We have lots of links here to um, offerings that we have. Um, one of them is the documentation for Identity Server. And so, what I'm going to show you here is sort of the, the big picture of um, what we're trying to solve with uh, with this, these protocols, but also specifically with Identity Server. Mm -hmm. So this is a picture showing the the kind of typical kinds of applications that people are building these days. And so what this is trying to show is that we have you know server side web applications. Mm -hmm. uh, we might have JavaScript based you know SPA style applications. Sure. Uh, we might have native, mobile, or even desktop applications like installed into your you know desktop operating system. Mm -hmm. And so these applications want to know who the user is. Okay, that's authentication. Right. Um, these apps then, of course, to perform a lot of their functionality, probably are going to be using back-end APIs. Mm -hmm. And so those APIs also want to know who the user is. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do in, um, you know, in our security architecture is identify the user, mm -hmm. authenticate them, and then be able to invoke APIs on behalf of that user. Interesting. In the past, in the last 10 or 20 years, at least in the Windows space, I've seen uh, things like impersonation, sure. where like an entire thread becomes the identity of someone. Sure. We saw DCOM 15, 20 years ago <laughs> trying yep. to call some, rather than explicitly calling on behalf of, they were trying to pretend to be that person and trying to flow that all the way to the back end. It was yep. very fragile and frustrating. Uh, sure. Um, and on the, on the other hand, though, um, it, it was. I absolutely agree with that. But, um, you know, in, back in the day, you know, you would get security kind of by free in, in IIS checking the little checkbox, right, integrated right, Windows authentication true. to that's enable true. what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, modern apps and modern deployment scenarios make that harder to use. Mm. Um, imagine you take your web app uh, and running on your web server and previously it was domain joined and that checkbox was checked and so your user coming in, if they're on the domain, they just get authenticated into your app and you don't have to think too much about it. Mm -hmm. um, take that web server and move it to the cloud. It's not domain joined anymore and you know those older security protocols that we relied upon like Kerberos right. um, can't work in these more modern and um, uh, more modern deployment scenarios and more modern apps. S same problem with your like your iOS app, mm -hmm. right? You know, domain join your your iOS um, your phone. 
Um, so anyway, th those are the problems um, that we're facing with these modern application architectures. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, so this picture showing then the kind of high level idea of what we're trying to build. And again, as you mentioned, every um, point in here, every network hop is where we want to do some sort of authentication. So every arrow on here needs some sort of security check. So the idea is that when you're calling from the browser to your server-side MVC app, that server-side app needs to know who the user is, mm -hmm. and that involves something on the network to prove who the user is. Mm -hmm. And then same thing, from the web app to the web API, same thing. You need to pass something along the network to prove um, that identity. Do, do each of these things necessarily have to be .NET? These APIs could be in PHP or Python or whatever. What point, what's, it, what's .NET and what's not? Right, so um, the protocols that we're about to describe here are um, OpenID Connect and OAuth 2 are, um, they were quite anticipated because um, they were uh, facilitating a lot of interoperability. Mm -hmm. So the design of these protocols are allowing, you know, an interop, a mix of different technology stacks. Cool. Okay. So anyway, let me, let me go um, and talk about the protocols here. So if you want to do security in your app and API, um, you could use like the templates out of the box for Visual Studio, um, file new project, and you have your own login page, and you have your own cookies that are being issued by your web app, and you may have um, accounts and registration code and account linking from a Google login. And the problem is that's fine, mm -hmm. but the minute you build a second app and a third app and a fourth app, you're duplicating that code in all three of those locations. Mm -hmm. So same thing. You, you don't want to, you know, you want to um, centralize that kind of thing, especially when you have lots of apps and lots of APIs. So that's, uh, there's a pattern that has evolved over the years, and this has actually been a pattern for a long time now, mm -hmm. of taking all that stuff out of your apps, mm -hmm. centralizing it, and that's what's called a security token service. Mm -hmm. Think of this as, uh, especially with microservices being the you know, kind of buzzword these days, um, the security token service acts as your centralized identity service for all of your applications. So its job is to know who your users are, be able to authenticate them, and then what it's going to do is take that authentication result mm -hmm. and convey it over to your apps and APIs. Okay, so in the pattern of microservices, it's all about single responsibility or minimal responsibility. In this case, sure. it's the STS is itself a microservice. Yeah, you can think of it that way. That's job is to do the auth auth. For yep, you. absolutely. All right, that okay. makes sense. So the, the problem here, though, of course, is that the security token service might be running on a totally different domain, right? Maybe it's running in the cloud and your apps are running on-prem or mm -hmm. vice versa. So we somehow need to securely across basically the internet mm -hmm. <laughs> convey the outcome of that authentication to your apps and to your APIs. So as the name implies, security token service, it's going to be creating tokens. And the tokens are what we deliver back to the apps mm -hmm. to prove the identity of the user and tokens are what the app then will use to call the API. Mm -hmm. And these tokens are, are significant. They're not just a GUID or a string. They're, they're cryptographically significant, yes. tamper-proof so things. So JSON web tokens are the um, typical tokens that we use um, in these more modern protocols, OpenID Connect and, mm -hmm. and OAuth 2. Um, so yes, so the, the token contains information about the user, mm -hmm. and, and it's also going to be, as you said, signed. So there's a digital signature and the signature is being created by the security token service itself. Mm -hmm. okay. So they encapsulate best practices, and I assume that they expire and different, things, different whatever you need them to do, they can sure. do. Sure, sure, absolutely. So there, there's a whole, um, like once you set up the basics, then you actually have some more architecture to, to sort out about things like session lifetime, how often do you, do you uh, expire these access tokens, how right. often does the user need to go back and re-authenticate. So absolutely, every environment has different requirements. So those are things that you are still going to have to think about and figure out what your, what your approach is going to be. But that's the benefit of using a more open system like this, that you have the ability to make those customizations and make those decisions. Yeah, yeah specifically with identity server. So, um, so actually, I guess we'll get into that, but uh, that's exactly um, the idea here is identity server is a framework for allowing you to build your own security token service. Okay, okay? so it's not so identity server is more than just a security token service out of the box. It is a toolkit as well for you to build your own right. that behaves the way you want it to work. We like to think of it as a framework. Mm -hmm. And so you pull it in. It's uh, sort of like jQuery or even kind of like MVC. Mm. It's a it's a library. You pull it in and you build around that. To, to solve your you know requirements. Yes, that makes okay. sense. Now there are other security token services out there. Mm -hmm. Okay, there are paid products that you can you can buy uh, to to solve this problem as well. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are 
um, you know, deployed on-prem. Some of them can be deployed to the cloud, a lot of cloud hosted. So uh, Ping Federate is an example of one, a commercial one that's very popular in the Java space. Um, some of the cloud hosted ones, obviously Azure Active Directory mm -hmm. is a, is a, a cloud um, security token service that, that Microsoft offers. Um, there is a company called Okta that provides one, there's Auth0, um, and there are a number of others as well. So it's actually quite a saturated space. So there's security token service as a service. Yes. Like you, someone else hosts it, handles it for you. Yep. And then there's ones that you can host yourself and you have more control over the flow and the experience. Yes, exactly. So uh, the reason we built Identity Server, uh, despite this being a saturated you know, market for security token services, is that we found that when we were doing security consulting for our customers, um, they obviously wanted this centralized identity management. This also gives you single sign-on. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are a lot of benefits to it. But the business requirements that our customers had, um, the token services that they were using, like some of the cloud-hosted ones or the, the paid products, they weren't flexible enough mm -hmm. to allow the customer to actually do things the way they wanted to. Okay? So that's actually why we created Identity Server, is uh, provide you a framework that does all the hard security stuff according to the specs, right. um, but allow you to do the kind of customization and provide you the flexibility that you need. Okay. So our goal over the course of the day here of this mm -hmm. MVA, we're going to actually host our own security token service yep. on Identity Server 4. Exactly. And we're going to then make both a web API and a web app, and they'll communicate with each other via that security token service in a secure right. way. And, and, and according to the standard as well, so the OpenID Connect and, and OAuth 2 protocols. Um, so again, one more thing about this, the beauty about the protocols is that, yes, you can stick in Identity Server, but if it doesn't work for you down the road, we're talking all protocols, mm -hmm. so you can swap it and, and pick something later on if it suits you better down the road. Okay? Excellent. But yeah, in terms of what we're doing today, identity server uh, is going to be the, the token service to use. All right, cool. All right. Is that a good overview? Yeah, I think that actually that gives us kind of an idea of what we're looking for. All yeah. right, so we understand the problem space, and we understand what we're going to try to accomplish today. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back, and we'll start building and writing some code. Hey friends, I'm here back with Brock Allen on uh, the Microsoft Virtual Academy. We're talking about Identity Server. We talked about the introduction. We got a sense of the problem space. Now we're going to get into some code. But before we do that, you've got kind of a really nice interaction diagram that's going to explain to me the interaction between the client, between my code, and yep. the Identity Server middleware. Absolutely. So um, Identity Server is not an out-of-the-box product, per se, where it's like an MSI and, and you install that onto your server. Hmm. Uh, as we mentioned before, the whole point is to um, provide a framework where you build the product. You are gonna, you're gonna build up your identity you know, and security token service. Mm -hmm. So the way Identity Server works is that uh, Identity Server is based on ASP.NET Core, okay. and the idea is that uh, it's delivered via a NuGet package, okay. Okay? and it is, um, in terms of how it uh, wires into ASP.NET Core, is it's predominantly implemented as a middleware. Okay. Okay? So what you're gonna do is you're gonna host, um, you're gonna build a host around this Identity Server, grab the NuGet, put the middleware into the pipeline, mm -hmm. okay? And the job of the identity server middleware is to implement the endpoints for those protocols that we talked about, OpenID Connect and OAuth 2, mm -hmm. okay? Now just to make sure I understand this, I'm not necessarily gonna take the app I want to protect and add identity server to it. I'm gonna make a separate host because I am implementing a, an STS. Yes, a security exactly. token service. Yeah. So this is a file new empty web app. Exactly, that's the idea. Okay. Um, we do have some templates, by the way. So mm. .NET Core has some, um, when you do um, uh, .NET new, you can actually specify a template. So we actually do have some templates. Excellent. Um, Visual Studio doesn't yet support them, but I think it will at some point. Mm -hmm. um, so within Visual Studio, you could do file new project and actually pick the identity server template. Very cool. Okay. Um, so yeah, so then the idea is that you have this middleware implementing these protocol endpoints. What's going to happen then is your client MVC application, right, the app that wants to know who the user is, mm -hmm. it's going to talk protocol to Identity Server. So yes, it's a separate application from Identity Server. Um, it is going to, whenever it needs to know who the user is, redirect them to log in, mm -hmm. just as if you would within your normal app, but we're sending them to the centralized login. Okay. okay? So when we send the user to the centralized login, then um, at that point, the user hasn't ever provided a password, for mm -hmm. example. So we need to authenticate them. So what Identity Server does then is it says, okay, I'm implementing the protocol endpoint, but I don't know who the user is, so I need your code to log them in. 
Okay, so the actual, to put not, not too fine a point on it, the, the text box that collects their username and their password and their whatever, right. that's me. That is not going you. to be you, yes. So when uh, the request that does come into Identity Server, it redirects the user one more time to, yes, your custom login page. And this is where you provide all the customizations to satisfy your requirements. And that's both the, that's the power of Identity Server is that you can do whatever makes you happy there. Absolutely. So uh, a lot of times people want to use um, both an employee login and a customer login. Okay, and so Identity Server, you know, if you figure that out on your login page, mm -hmm. you absolutely can do that, and then that will be, you know, delivered back to your application cool. uh, as whichever user logged in. Um, it could be a Google login. Okay, um, you can even have Identity Server on your login page um, connect to yet another identity provider. So if you are trying to log in, like um, you know, Windows users, and those are all stored up in Azure Active Directory. You can have Identity Server sort of chain to Azure Active Directory. Okay, so I'm starting to understand the power of this. Let's say that I've got a website. It's going to be a social website. My yep. admins are going to be Windows Active Directory, Act, Azure Active Directory, because they're yep. administrators. Yep. Like I'm doing Stack Overflow. Yep. But I want my users to log in with Twitter or Google or, or Facebook. Or a password. Or yeah, a password itself. Absolutely. Excellent. Yep. That makes so sense. So that's that's one of the, the very powerful use case scenarios of Identity and Server. And those are the scenarios that aren't easy without a, a security token service. Exactly, or without the ability to customize it. Ability yes, to exactly. customize. Well, yeah, yes. that's a good point. A, a regular security token service off the, um, off the shelf may not have any customer ability like that. I can use Twitter as a login, right? but then it's like, do I want my admins to log in via Twitter? Right. I'd really rather they use my and again, existing it, one. It really depends on the off-the-shelf product that you're talking about, what mm. it does and doesn't support, I see. and how much effort it is to do those customizations if, if it allows that at all. So then the power here is you just write whatever code you want to do Absolutely. the customization. Absolutely. All right. So um, another uh, 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 motivation for using Identity Server then is um, not only can you use whatever identity store or whatever mechanism for authentication you want, but also during that login workflow, you can implement any additional logic around that, um, that login workflow that you want for the user. So a really simple example is what if you, know, you have five different apps, okay. they're all trusting identity server to log the user in, mm -hmm. and before the user uses any of those apps, mm -hmm. you want them to sign a EULA. Oh, yeah. Okay. A very common thing. I did that logging into a game recently. Yeah. I had to read a whole privacy. Exactly. Right. Scroll all the Which way down. no one reads, thing. but still. <laughs> You've checked the checkbox. I held down page down yeah. for a long time. Um, so you don't want to write that code in each of the five MVC apps. Good point. Right? If they're already sending the user to log in at the centralized location, you could have that logic centralized as well. All right. Okay? So that's another uh, very common use case. And again, it could be EULAs or it could be anything else that your business needs the user to do as they're logging in. As well as sophisticated multi-factor auth types of things. Absolutely. That's the other thing, too. Is again, that's sort of the same, whole, same idea. You don't want to re-implement any of these things in each one of your apps, so you're putting it in one place, yeah. and you do it the way you want to do it. And to your point about microservices, the, the responsibility of your client isn't to manage that stuff. That is what a security token Absolutely. is for. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, let's do some. Okay. So, yeah. So, um, so Identity Server is going to receive the request, send the user to your local login page. Your local login page will do whatever it is to log them in. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to send the user back to this authorized endpoint. The authorized endpoint is the protocol endpoint where the user uh, is shown a UI. Is this all happening on the glass? Is this HTTP level? Uh, bouncing around with 302s, or there, is there any back channel where we're... So, for what we're talking about right here, no, there's no back channel. Mm -hmm. So this is just the user in the browser. They went to the MVC app. It first goes to the identity server protocol endpoint, redirects you to login. Mm -hmm. okay? You log in. When you log in, another point by this is that the way that your login code communicates the identity of the user over to identity servers, you issue a cookie, mm. okay? So then, yes, we're doing all these redirects in the browser. The login page redirects back to this thing called the authorized endpoint. Identity server can read the cookie. We know who the user is, and we will generate the token back to the client application. Nice. Okay? And, and again, yes. all based on standards. Yeah, that's the whole point. Very cool. Okay. So that's kind of a high-level idea about how Identity Server fits in and how you're going to work with it in your application. Makes sense. Now, for Identity Server to, again, do all these things for you, you do have to teach it about your environment. You need to teach Identity Server um, about your applications, okay. about your users, 
and about the identity data that you are protecting of those users. Because think about this, the whole point of centralizing this is that an app wants the user's uh, unique ID and their email, mm -hmm. okay? And some other app may want the unique ID of the user and their name. So those are uh, identity information that identity server is protecting about the user. So you do have to teach identity server uh, about these things. Okay. Um, so here's kind of a little picture that shows um, the relationship between these. So again, our users are using what are called clients. That's like your MVC app. Mm -hmm. um, those clients are sending the user to identity server to authenticate, and identity server produces then this this um, you know protection for your resources. Um, so the identity data and also your APIs. So if I've got five applications and only one of them needs birthday information, mm -hmm. there's no reason to let that PII that leak out to the other applications. Yeah, and that's all configurable and under your control. All right, very okay. cool. Okay, so that's the high level idea here. So I'm gonna switch over to Visual Studio. Uh, let's see, and what we have here, just to give you an overview, is we have three um, projects. So let's zoom in on that, we've got. Yep, oh actually let me close that here. So yes, what we basically have is a solution with these three, three projects. So as we mentioned, Identity Server is gonna be hosted in its own separate application. Okay. okay? So this is an ASP.NET Core application hosting uh, identity server, uh, and it already has the NuGet referenced, but it's basically a, an empty um, uh, ASP.NET Core mm -hmm. application. Okay, so what we're going to then do is we're going to have this other app, this MVC app, connect up to Identity Server to authenticate the user. Right. Okay, so that's going to be the first step that we're really going to do. Mm -hmm. um, later on, then this MVC app will invoke a Web API on behalf of that user. Okay, so that's we'll get to that in a little bit later. Um, but that's our main goal right now is to set up Identity Server and connect the MVC app to it for authentication. Okay, so for this module, success is I load up my MVC application, I click login, I, I am sent over to Identity Server. Yep. And then Identity Server has to make some decision about whether or not it's going to issue a token on my behalf. Yep, absolutely. All right. And then it sends the result back to the MVC app, and we should see the user logged into the MVC app. Awesome. Okay. Okay. So. Um, I guess we'll start with Identity Server because we have to you know, get started somewhere. So as I mentioned, Identity Server, the starter code has essentially an empty MVC project um, because you're gonna be showing some UI, so you probably wanna do that with MVC, okay? okay? Uh, I have my startup code. This is where all of the, the standard uh, you know, configuration is done for an ASP.NET Core application. Mm -hmm. So configure services is our standard DI configuration. Uh, configure is the method that configures the uh, ASP.NET Core pipeline with all the middleware. Mm -hmm. So we have all the kind of out of the box middleware here. We have static files and we have MVC and our error handling and all that. So like I said, I already have Identity Server referenced as a NuGet package. So to pop Identity Server into your hosting application so it can serve up those protocol endpoints, mm -hmm. I'm going to then use Identity Server. Okay, and that's as simple as that to pop it into the middleware pipeline. Was it important that you put it before you use MVC and bef after you use static files? Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's a really good point too. Is that so? Identity Server um, and uh, MVC. Well, actually, it depends on the workflow that you're using. But no, actually, in this case, because Identity Server is listening on a set of endpoints, but redirects the user mm -hmm. to your MVC app, then um, no. In this case, it was it was okay to put it uh, anywhere. I, I'm just so used to putting my authentication middleware. Mm -hmm. Right before MVC, that's what well, I Well, the reason I'm pointing it out is that I think from a gotcha's perspective, if you have something in an MVC app that is a greedy route, yep. it might, if, if Identity Server was towards the end, one of your routes might... Yeah, no, that's a, that is a good point. So, yes, uh, typically you do want to stick this in front of your MVC for things like that. Okay, that okay. makes sense. Okay, so the middleware by itself is actually not quite enough because, as I mentioned, we have to teach Identity Server about your clients and your users. Cool. So the other thing um, that this project... Um, has is it does have the starter code, uh, like a, a template code that I mentioned a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. um, that all lives under this controllers folder and it has uh, examples or samples for your typical account controller um, where the user can log in and things like that. So there's, there's these came in when you made this with the template? Yes, when I made this with the template that these uh, got put in here. Cool. This is template code to get you started, mm. but this is the code you're gonna own and you're gonna tweak and change to satisfy whatever requirements you okay, want. Okay, so it, it very likely, if not completely likely, you're not gonna use it as it is. Right, this is getting started. Again, just to get you started, exactly. All right. So as part of my sample code, um, again, one of the things I had to teach Identity Server about was my users. Right. So what you use for your user 
database, if you will, is entirely up to you. Mm. So you could use ASP.NET Identity if mm -hmm. you're, you know, kind of greenfield, brand new identity database. Sure. Um, you may have a legacy database of users. That's also a very common thing is that, you know, you're stuck with this old database of users and you're not ready to migrate it away. And you can't import that. To I some, think we've all yeah, been there. Somewhere exactly. out there, there's an Access yeah, 2 database exactly. <laughs> called Users. Right. So anyway, that's the idea is that you're going to plug that in. Mm -hmm. For my little sample code here, what I've done is I have these um, hard-coded in-memory list of test users. Mm -hmm. So that's the idea is that that's my little uh, legacy fake database sure. to get started. But I'm hearing ultimately the list of users is responsible. You're responsible for it. It can be a database. It can yep. be files. It can be whatever. It's up to you. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, one thing that I think is worth just kind of getting into a, a little bit is you said and you can use ASP.NET ASP.NET identity. Maybe yes. you could talk a little bit about the relationship between I, identity server and ASP.NET identity because some right. people might have thought well wait is, is one replacing the other are they complementary yes, or is and, one and they're both using the word identity so right. obviously that that can be confusing. So fundamentally what ASP.NET identity is which is the framework for Microsoft that was built in part of ASP.NET Core mm -hmm. is it is a framework or a library for managing the database that contains your user's authentication information. Mm -hmm. Predominantly, that's a password. Okay? It also does uh, many other f uh, functionality in terms of things like uh, email confirmation, two-factor authentication, you know, uh, mm -hmm. verify your mobile phone number, things like that. But I think of ASP.NET Identity as simply a library that talks to your database that holds your users. Okay, which okay? is one more thing I don't have to write. Absolutely, and that's another perfect example. Writing that kind of library and doing it securely is also really, really hard. So the ASP.NET um, identity library in ASP.NET Core um, does a really good job of all those things. Okay. okay, but it doesn't do OAuth to... It doesn't do these security protocols. Security okay? protocols. So the other thing then is the database of users, you're going to build this login page that does that check. Um, that code, like I said, has to communicate to the identity server side of things, and there's also a cookie involved there. Mm. So the, the login code is going to be using the cookie authentication middleware to talk to identity server. So actually, that's another, um, uh, another thing that I actually, um, that we're going to be adding here. So identity server uh, adds the cookie authentication middleware as well mm. um, to your hosting application. Okay. If you want to take control over that and add it yourself, you can. Okay, not a big deal, but anyway, cool. that's another thing that's in here. Okay, so yes, our login page, it's gonna issue a cookie, our demo code here is using these test users. So as I was trying to build up here too, is that we need to teach Identity Server about all these different things. All right. So the other half of Identity Server, if you will, is configured via the DI system. Identity the, Server yeah, provides, injection. exactly. Um, it provides a bunch of services that are available in dependency injection. Mm -hmm. So just like MVC has added, they have a little extension method. We have an add identity server uh, extension method that will wire up the core services. Mm -hmm. And then you are going to call some extension methods on this to, um, to configure some of the other things. Okay. Um, so like I said um, in my earlier picture, we have to teach it about your users, your clients, and the resources that it's protecting. Okay. okay. Um, so there are various um, exten uh, extension methods that we're going to call. Now, Identity Server, as I mentioned, is very flexible and, and it's designed for extensibility. So there's going to be a bunch of configuration data that Identity Server needs, and we don't mandate where you store that data. Hmm. Okay, So um, the list of your MVC apps and the list of your APIs could be in a database or could be in a JSON file, or you could even hard code it in, in your application. Mm -hmm. So we have an extensibility point that you could implement to go load that information wherever, wherever you um, uh, have it. The extension method I'm about to show you is registering our in-memory store mm -hmm. for this configuration data. The one of test users? Yes, uh, the okay. test users and the clients and um, our APIs. Okay. So what we have is we have add test users. Now test. add test users, did you write that? Yes, that this is our extension method that is just hooking up to um, the this in-memory list of users. Okay. And, uh, how is it doing that? Like, I feel like that's, we don't want to gloss too far over sure. that. Did add test users come with Identity Server for the purposes of initial testing? So in Identity Server, mm -hmm. when it's issuing these tokens, mm -hmm. at some point your app might say, I need the email of the user. Right. So Identity Server needs to query something to fetch the email. Right. So that's an extensibility point. Okay. So that extensibility point is basically saying, hey, uh, I need the user's email, and your extensibility point would return that. Right. Okay. 
So this, uh, and, and uh, it's an interface that you would, uh, you would implement. Yes. Okay? So if you stick that interface into the dependency injection system, we find your implementation. Makes okay? sense. This extension method I'm using here is registering an implementation of that interface mm -hmm. that is triggered off of this in-memory set of users. Okay. Okay. So there are a couple more for the other, uh, other sure, ones sure. here. So I'm just trying to understand that in a real scenario, add test users would go away, go, go away and I would exactly. write something else. Yes, you would implement what's called our iProfile service. Okay. Okay. And that's to load user profile data. Okay. So we have similar ones for adding clients, add um, identity resources, and add API resources. And so would, I'm going to talk you, about these. Would examples. you recommend when people get started that they do add test users as they are building up, and then they remove that and swap? You know, like should they start with all these in-memory examples and these test users, and then slowly yeah, remove that, them? That's actually a good point. So yes, what we typically recommend is you start with all this in-memory configuration mm -hmm. to reduce all the the variables. Moving parts. Exactly. Um, and you'll start to get a feel for how Identity Server works and how your app can wire up to it, which okay. is exactly the, the demo that we're building here. Right. But yes, once you get more comfortable with that, then you're going to decide, oh, I want to plug in my real user database, mm. um, and that's where you'll replace this with, with your own. Okay, that okay. makes sense. I'm trying to get my head around this because yeah, we're going to get this working, but it'll all be fake and in memory and test. And then, then the next step would be to remove add test users and right. swap out something right. real, remove in-memory clients and exactly. swap out something real. Yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, and that's another thing is that if you do move away from this in-memory hard-coded configuration uh, and want to use a proper database, we have a pre, uh, we've already implemented the interface on top of Entity Framework. Nice. So you could just pop in our Entity Framework implementation and then just you know, basically configure your connection string and go from there. Cool. Okay, so for now, my hard-coded in-memory config, right. I have in this config.cs um, file. Okay, so I have some APIs to load from my configuration system. And again, that can be anywhere. This could be anywhere, uh, and you would implement the extensibility point. Makes so sense. for loading clients, there's an interface called iClientStore. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you would load them from the database rather than this hard-coded list. So the configuration data that I'm about to fill in here is our object model for our configuration system. Okay. okay, so we've defined what a client is. We've defined what an identity resource is. We've defined an API resource. Mm -hmm. So if you did implement your own, your implementation would load the data from wherever, but you would have to return our object model so that we can operate on that, that of data. Of course, okay? makes sense. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do in here is I'm going to, right now they don't return anything, but just to pop these in here, I'm going to do config.get uh, clients, uh, config.get identity resources, and here it's going to do config.get API resources. So just to, to fill those in, mm -hmm. even though they're empty and we're not going to do our API quite yet. Okay, so there's one more thing I need to configure, and I, I do understand there is a bit of uh, a, a bit of a learning curve here trying sure. to trying well, to get get your head wrapped around. And we're going to do our best to unpack it. Okay. <laughs> um, so the last thing is I remembered identity server issues tokens. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we said that those are JSON web tokens. Right. And those are um, secure in the sense that they are digitally signed, okay? So to do a digital signature, you need to have key material, mm. okay? So identity server um, needs to know what your key material is gonna be, okay? Okay. A lot of times what people just use is a, a self-signed certificate, okay? Because it has a public and private key pair. Sure. So I have installed already on my computer a certificate, mm -hmm. okay? It's, again, you can use make cert, it's just a command line tool. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm gonna tell identity server that that's the certificate um, to use. So in my Windows certificate store, um, I have a uh, certificate with the common name called STS. Okay. Okay. So I'm just telling Identity Server that's the certificate to use. Okay. So that's all this configuration for now. So just to be clear though, the make cert you got from where? You got part of the Windows SDK. Yes, make cert is provided part of the Windows SDK. So if you install the Windows SDK, you have that make cert, and then you have the common name for that, you named it STS. Yep. Yep. So you made that cert and you installed it with the cert manager.msc. Yes, exactly. Yep, you use MMC, you pop, uh, uh, pull the uh, snap in, I think is what mm -hmm. they're called, yep. and it's the win yeah, the cert. Just wanted to make sure that everyone store. understands how to do that. There's also, um, you can, there's also uh, PowerShell commands mm -hmm. to do the same thing. Okay, cool. So that's another option. Is this under personal? Like if you, if you run right yeah. now certmgr.msc, uh, .msc, you'll so load up. So there's your certs. These are under my local computer because what's going to happen is eventually when you deploy this to a real environment, it's mm. going to be running as a system account. Oh, you, so you want, you want this available to, local. to the to machine 
um, not specifically to my user. Okay. So yes, that and actually, sense. here's my certificate right there. STS. Okay, Excellent. exactly. Thank you. All right, so that's the certificate I want to use for all of my tokens. Mm. Okay, so now back over here in my config, this is where we're going to fill in all of the other details. So I'm going to have an MVC application, and so I need to create a client in this configuration system to model it. So I'm going to create something called a client. Um, clients are identified with what's called a client ID. It's just a unique identifier, string. You give it a, a human readable name, or you mm -hmm. generate a GUID, whatever. So you're doing this client, you're putting this client in the host for identity server. Yes. That means it has to know about all clients. You can't have an unknown client? Correct. You want your client, you want your token server to know about your clients ahead of time. Okay. Um, if you've ever set up Google logins, sure. you've done the exact same thing. Right? You oh, actually, when you go in and put in an app and you, it, and you create a new app, they give you a code. Yes, this is the exact equivalent of that scenario for Google. Okay? okay. So you have to teach the token server about the consuming app, and that's exactly what this so, is So doing. in this case, you're, you're hard-coding it. That could come from a, a database, exactly. and you could invent that thing where people inside of your company could go and register themselves Absolutely. as clients. Absolutely. So you could build a UI for your customers to come to you if they wanted to integrate, or exactly, within your own ecosystem. Which makes me, I'm going like from step A to step G here, but <laughs> if I have a web API, then I could go and create... Uh, all kinds of user interfaces to allow people to use my web API to yep. register themselves as clients in a secure way. Yep. Okay, cool. Yep. So that's the MVC application. Yep. So there are a few more things in here. We're going to give it a name. So this is my MVC demo. Um, we are going to configure what's called the allowed grant type. And again, my apologies, there is some more complexity that we have to talk about here. So. OpenID Connect, as I showed in the very uh, initial picture, we mm -hmm. have lots of different types of apps. We have server-side apps, spas, native apps. Right. Okay. So what this, um, these protocols have is what are called flows, um, and the flow is a description of the uh, type of application and how that application is going to be communicating with the token server. So the interaction model for that. Exactly. Like when I was asking you before, are we going to be integrating on the glass? Are we just going to bounce around right. at the URL level? Right. Or might our interaction be different if we were an iPhone app? Correct. Okay. So that's the idea here is that you have to teach Identity Server about the type of app that uh, is going to be connecting. And that's what this thing called, a, a, in the spec, they call it a grant type. Hmm. Okay. The interaction model makes sense. The name of calling it grant type is not intuitive. Uh, yeah. And... The, the caveat I'll, I'll say here is that if you are using a paid hosted product, mm -hmm. you're probably doing that because you want to know nothing about how the security works. I, they've okay? hidden a lot of it from you. Yeah. And um, if you're building identity server, um, I would highly encourage you to read the spec so you know what you're building. Mm -hmm. So that, unfortunately, you, know, you have to know how this, this okay. protocol works. So what does implicit imply? So <laughs> implicit means that right now, that my client, mm -hmm. the way it communicates with the token server, will only be through the browser right now. Okay. Okay. You had mentioned a back channel call. Right. We'll do that a little bit later, and mm -hmm. that'll change this configuration. But for now, we're doing baby steps. Makes sense. Okay. So the next thing we need to know is what is called the redirect URI. That's basically the URL of your MVC app where it gets the results. Hmm. Okay. And I've done this before too, even when I've made local host apps for Twitter. Yeah. They want to know, I'm sent you over to Twitter, how do you get back? That's exactly what this is. Excellent. Okay. Um, I actually don't know off the top of my head what my MVC app is hosted on. So I will go and um, get that URL real quick. So it looks like my file new project created that uh, URL. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to pop this in. Now, we don't want to send the user back to just any place in the app, so it turns out that in the MVC app, we're going to want a um, designated like landing place sure. for the user. So, And in the MVC app, the, the component that we're going to use to communicate with this protocol, mm -hmm. there is an OpenID Connect middleware that will be put into the MVC app. Okay. It defines this path. Is that an identity server piece of middleware or an ASP.NET so piece of middleware? So that middleware, the OpenID Connect one that the MVC app will be using is from Microsoft. Cool. Okay. Okay. And the, you've just put it at sign in dash OIDC. Is that a known thing or mm -hmm. you just make that up? That is the hard coded path in the, uh, the OpenID Connect middleware. It is from Microsoft. It is from Microsoft. It is configurable though. Okay. okay. That's cool. Yeah. Um, okay. One more thing is. Uh, I want to configure what's called the allowed scopes. Mm -hmm. okay. Scopes are the uh, are labels for the resources that Identity Server is protecting. 
-hmm. Okay. So an example of something that you might want uh, the, the identity server is protecting is the email of the user. Uh -huh. Okay. So scopes are basically saying, which um, these are the resources that your identity server is protecting, and um, the client can request certain types of identity information about the user. Okay. So this is basically setting up an allowed list. Remember, you, you said a second uh, mm -hmm. earlier that maybe one app should be allowed to get the user's uh, age or birthday, right. but another app should not. And that's kind of what this is doing. So identity server is going to know ahead of time that this client, yes. the scope of its interest in this user's resources exactly. is limited to these things. Yep. So actually, before I fill these in, that's the other thing to fill in here is you have to teach identity server about the total set of resources it's protecting. I see. Okay? All the so, things it could ever tell anyone about me. Exactly. Okay. So that's what this thing called identity resources are. The OpenID Connect spec defines ahead of time a few of these already. Mm -hmm. And um, there's one called OpenID, which means it's your user's unique ID. Right. Okay. So that's the imp most important thing that an app is going to care about. It's a URI about. or a GUID or something that it's, describes the user. Yeah. It's an opaque string, but it's going to be the same value when that user logs in again and again and again. Okay. okay. In the .NET terms, that turns into what's called the subject claim. So the subject identifier, that's the unique ID of the right. user. Okay. All right. So we might care about the email. So the spec defines email. Um, there's also something called profile, which actually maps to like several things about the user. Their, um, their display name, their username, their first name, their last name, their URL, things like that. Yeah. You can invent your own. Okay. So if you're talking about a scenario where maybe your employees are logging in, I might want to know identity information about the employee. So we might have a new identity resource here, and the name is going to be your office location. Oh, interesting. So you've got identity resource as a type, and then in this case here, it's just uh, name value pairs. It's an anonymous type. Um, so I'm sorry, say again? I'm trying to understand how you're making identity resource. Uh, is, is name and user claims properties so, inside of identity yes, resource? Yes, absolutely. Oh, so these are, the, these are the properties on our configuration. Right. What if there are ones, oh, I see, and if there's ones that, you, that don't fit, you put them in user claims. So what this is doing is we are saying that, hey, I have, for my users, they have office information. Mm, okay? Gotcha, gotcha. My app might want to know about that. And when it asks for this thing called office, we are going to give it claims about the user. Mm -hmm. So that might be the office number and you know the building, sure. know, the cube number, and things Whatever. like that. Totally okay? open-ended. So for example, actually, in our test users, let's, I don't have this right now, but let's go hack this up. So I'm going to have my user Alice and Bob. They're going to be logging in. And here's okay. some identity data about them. Sure. So they have a name and a, you know email and so on and so forth. Right. So and those are all, and I'm noticing you're using JWT claim types, so that, yep. that they're limited to that enum. But here you're using a name value. Pair. Yeah, so the, the, the claim type here, these are just strings. Ah, okay? so convenience. These, these strings are whatever you want them to be. Nice. And the OpenID Connect specification, as I mentioned earlier, predefines a bunch of this data, like email and your name and I things see. like that. So these this. are well known claims. These and are well known yours claims. Yours is your own. And then this is custom for you know, your scenario. Okay. So we're, so in building yeah, we're in building 25 today. So we're in, oh no, sorry, not office number. What did I call it? Oh, I did call it office number. Okay, good. So we're in building number 25. Good enough. Did you need to put a comma after that? Uh, this is just a no, collection of Back on the other one, I was just fine. Just oh, you're right, I did. Sorry. Thank you. Okay, That's pair programming. Good. All right. <laughs> I've added my value today. <laughs> good night, everybody. <laughs> All right. Okay, cool. So cool. there's some custom identity data, maybe for your scenario, for cool. example. Okay, so the point is we have these things that we're protecting. Um, this application, maybe it's uh, your MVC app, so what I'm saying is here, um, yes, allow this app to get the user's unique ID. Mm -hmm. Yes, allow this app to get this user's email. And yes, allow this app to get the user's office information. This is a nit question, but is it appropriate that those be magic strings, or should you use some of the, uh, the existing well-known yeah. structures you have? A absolutely. So usually what we recommend people do is put these into constants. Mm -hmm. Okay, And so that's what you might use down here. For like office. Yeah, for a ex perfect example. And cool. even, even the claim types here as well, sort of like what we, you know. Yeah, you could spend a day looking for misspellings. Yes, here. exactly. No, you're absolutely right. Is it case sensitive? Yes, it will be case sensitive. Okay, okay. good to know. Okay. All right. Okay. So I think that's like about all we need right now for the client. Um, so we have users. We have things that they claim. We have things that we know that we need to protect. Yeah, and we, we have our know, little database of them. Do we have the uh, the OIDC part that is going to come? At, we're going to bounce back over to the MVC application. You so have our. We haven't touched the MVC app. Yet. Haven't touched it at okay, all. Okay, so we're, we're going to do that only in identity server. Yes. Okay. All right. 
Uh, and then our login page. Oh, which yeah. Do we have a login page? We do have a login page. So that's under this account controller. This mm -hmm. is, again, the thing that comes from our, our templates. Okay, so we got a login page that was like for free because yes. we used the template when we made the identity server. Yep. But totally configurable up to us. Yeah, and so if you cruise through here, I'm not, I don't want to spend too much time on this because this is code you probably would, would change or, or remove. Sure. But the idea is this is a standard account controller. It's going to have a login action method. It's going to have one where you post back the username and password. And, it, and the default code here is checking the in-memory test database right. for your users. Sure. And okay. you make these look however you want them to look. And then the views, yes, the views are actually under the views folder. And mm -hmm. as you can see, there's a login and a logout and so on and so forth. Cool. OK. okay. So yes, we got past the hurdle of some of the confusing and complicated uh, configuration settings. Um, and that's where, again, like I mentioned, you're going to have to understand how these things work to some extent. Um, the, like the names that you were commenting about, mm -hmm. these are coming right from the spec. Mm -hmm. So the more you know about the spec, the more you'll understand what is this like a 90 page spec I have to read? Or Unfortunately, yeah. 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 And there are actually several of them. Okay. <laughs> okay. But you really do recommend that our viewers and the people who are interested in this space spend some time learn in more about it. Yes. Yeah. Learn more about Don't it. Don't do this blindly. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's another good point is that on our um, identityserver.io docs website, uh, we have quite a bit of documentation about this. Mm -hmm. um, and we also have quick starts. So these quick starts are actually, you know, hand, you know, step by step walkthroughs, basically what I'm showing you here. Mm -hmm. um, so if you know you want to take more time and do this on your own, we have lots and lots here. Um, this is where you know getting you started. Um, we have one uh, protecting APIs. We have one that actually uses ASP.NET identity in here, if I can see. So we have templates that are getting everybody kind of jump started. Cool. Okay. Okay. Great. So we have our identity server set up. Let's run it and see Does if it, it works. Does it compile? Yeah, that's, that's a good point. <laughs> I've written this code enough that I think it might, I might have it down by now. There we go. OK, Excellent. it does compile. Nice. Ship it. I will run this. And oh, and I'm actually running. So what are you running? You've got three projects there. Which one are you going to run multiple at the same yes. time? Yes. So what I'm doing is as I select a different one, it's going to launch that particular one. OK. OK. So I just launched Identity Server. We happen to be running out of the console app. Right. Um, we've configured Visual Studio to do it that way. So here it is. What's nice about this mm -hmm. is when Identity Server, or <laughs> when you misconfigure Identity Server, yeah. um, Identity Server will complain. Mm -hmm. um, the UI, you won't see much. Because okay, you don't want to leak information to an attacker or mm, an end point. user. So Identity Server um, heavily util utilizes the logging system in ASP.NET Core. Nice. So when there's an error, you go to the, the, the logging output, and it'll be right there. Excellent. Okay. So I'm sure I will screw something up, but we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully look for it here. No, that's good. So that's why I like running the console. Because mm -hmm. okay? if you're running an IS Express, sometimes hidden, Hard and then if you use a log file, you'll have to go find that. Okay, great. It's up and running. Did, I, did my browser come up? Oh, it did. Here we go. So we just have a little simple yeah. homepage saying hello. It's more for developers, but sure. again, you maybe even remove this when you move to production. Cool. Okay. One of the things to pr prove or test that Identity Server is really kind of properly configured is in OpenID Connect, mm -hmm. um, there is one of these other specs is um, something called the discovery specification. So mm -hmm. the idea is that there's a whole bunch of information about this token server that your app is going to need to know. You're going to need to know what URL to send them to, the, uh, to send the user to. OK, let me it, guess. Is there some well-known places where I can poke at it and they can tell me about it? So it's funny that you even say it that way, because that's exactly what the spec calls this. This is the well-known endpoint. Ooh. If you even look in the, the browser, it's called the well-known well well endpoint. There you go. Right? Nice. So the idea is that this is a, a JSON document uh -huh. that your MVC app will query to figure out things like what URLs I want to send okay, the user to. Okay, so it's to. the description language. It's, it's the, absolutely. It's kind of like the WSDL, if you will, of, sure. of your token I'm server. I'm glad that you said okay. that, yeah, not me. Exactly. <laughs> um, and there's nothing here that's private. This is really just no, exploring is, the space. Exactly. Uh, so the, the one endpoint that I mentioned earlier is called the authorized endpoint, mm -hmm. and that's the one that we're going to see the user go to here in a minute. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I just want to make one comment from a specifications perspective. Yes. It's not necessarily, if I understand correctly, that the spec describes the shape of the URLs. Does it just describe those terms on the left, and the URLs are up to the implementation? Correct. This is a very restful sort of interface, if you will. So yes, they define the 
um, the, sh the, the, the property names here. Mm -hmm. And then, yes, what you put in for the URLs, that's up to you. Okay. Yeah, so that's your implementation details. So Identity Server, under the Connect path, we do authorize, and we use Connect just because it's open. So if I were using some, I don't know, I've never heard of it, but let's say there's some PHP Identity Server out mm -hmm. there. It might have a totally different... URL structure, correct. But its well-known location would describe these this way. Yes. Yeah, so what your what you always know is relative to the base address of the token server, mm -hmm. wherever that is. It could still be hosted under subpaths, right? But relative to that base path, you can go find dot well dash known slash open id dash configuration. Cool. Okay. Um, the other important thing that's under here is remember I said that there's tokens that mm -hmm. are signed. Mm -hmm. Your app, when it receives them, needs to validate them. Against? Against what? Well, that's the key material. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing that's in these documents, right? In these well-known documents. So this is actually my RSA key that I had configured um, in Identity Server. If you recall, remember in Identity Server, I did... So if you had not put that CN, the common name equals STS, if that had failed when you visited that... You're not going to see You'd anything. see a problem. Yeah. Yep. And I, if I recall correctly, I think we even throw an exception if you haven't configured before you even get yeah, that before far. you even get that far. Cool. So at this point, you've done the smoke test. Yes, that's exactly the point of, of showing this to you is just to make sure I got it right <laughs> that, that I actually configured this properly. All right, cool. So yeah, that's the key material. This is the public key material, public key by the way, sure. not the private Sorry. key. This okay. is this is unauthenticated endpoint, and yep. it's totally fine. I suppose we could probably go poking around on Twitter or other places and see their well known. Absolutely, as well. Azure has one as well. Yeah, you can go look at theirs. Cool. Exactly. Okay, so that's all well and good. So let's close this down and let's switch to my um, MVC app. Excellent. Okay, so my MVC app now, um, this is a pretty much out of the box empty MVC project. Cool. Um, so what we have is the standard startup here. Okay, so again, this looks very much like the other one did. Mm -hmm. A little bit of MVC, some logging, static files, and MVC. Cool. We don't have anything security yet. Have you added any NuGets or anything custom? So yes, I do have the NuGets for the two main things I need. One is the NuGet for the OpenID Connect middleware that the MVC app uses. Right. So that's a piece of middleware that will know how to redirect the user to the authorized endpoint in mm -hmm. Identity Server, get back the result, do all the token validation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Once that handshake is done with the token server, you need to keep track of the user within the MVC app. Mm -hmm. So you also need to issue a cookie. Mm -hmm. So those are the two middlewares I have, okay. is the cookie authentication middleware and the OpenID Connect one. Okay. All right, so let's add those guys in. App use cookie authentication. Okay. And, and that's a Microsoft. This is absolutely Microsoft. this is Microsoft's uh, cookie authentication middleware. Okay. Um, you have to pro, you know give this guy a name. So cookies seems like a good name. Um, and there are other properties on that controlling the cookie. Um, how long does the cookie live? Mm -hmm. Properties. Does like that, that name matter? What well, this name matters in that um, when I need to identify the fact that I want to use the cookie middleware, yeah, that name matters. So in other words. We're going to have two security middlewares, the cookie middleware and the OpenID Connect guy. They're mm -hmm. both security middlewares, so you need to give them a name, in essence, is what that's doing. Okay. Okay. So, app.use OpenID Connect authentication. Okay, so what NuGet package did that come out of? I'm sure I can find the cookie one. I think I might have more trouble yes. finding that Yes, so one. they both actually come out of very similar um, names. It's uh, Microsoft ASP.NET Core dot authentication dot cookies and dot OpenID Connect. Nice. Okay. That's, we, can 90, see it. we can see it in dependencies. I'm 99% sure. Let's go check this guy out. So this is actually going right Authentication. to Authentication.openid connect hey, and there we cookies. Go. Excellent. Okay. All right, that's good to know. Good. Okay, so this configuration over on the client side is where it kind of needs to match the configuration I did on identity server for this app. So we need to do things like, um, actually the first thing is, what open ID Connect provider do we trust? That's something called the authority. It's mm -hmm. basically the base address of identity server. Okay, so on the other side, we told it about a client called MVC. Yeah. And now on this side, we're giving it the well-known, the, the now well-known URL. Exactly. And you're setting that one on 5,000, and of course you uh, had another one on this side. Yeah, and that's because identity server was listening it started at up on 5,000. 5, exactly. Cool. Okay. All right, now we're doing local development here, so we're not going over SSL. Mm -hmm. So there's a, um, an opt-out uh, sure. for a security check here. 
Um, so I'm saying, yeah, I know I'm running local development right. testing. So, and I'm sure so. that we could uh, do self-signed local host stuff if we thought yeah, like yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. We're fine we're, without worry that about it later. local host. Um, obviously, when you go to production or even staging or QA, um, everything should be over HTTPS. Cool. Okay. Okay, so that's a little bit about the token server we're using. Mm -hmm. um, I need to say, okay, well, who am I? I'm the MVC client, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and then what I wanna do is indicate at the protocol level what it is I want back from the token server. Okay. Ah, so the token server had that list of claims which was, which was comprehensive. Yep. And on this side, you just want the, the couple, three or four things you want. So yeah, so that there are actually two different things we're setting. That's one of them. That okay. was the, th it's the thing called the scope. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I want is, remember I said that the, uh, the, the token server could issue multiple types of tokens. Mm -hmm. And right now, I just want the authentication token. So that's this property that I'm setting right now, is I'm saying I only want that. I'm not yet calling an API, so I don't need the access token. Okay. You're proving that we are who we said we are, but we're not gonna go and figure out my office and all of the other information. That's no, later. this will give me the user's identity information. Okay. I'm just not yet able to call an API on their behalf. Ah, uh, okay. That's what, the, that's that's what I'm distinction. That's what I'm not yet doing. That's an important okay. distinction. Um, and then the scope are the corresponding scopes that I had talked about before. Open ID, email, and office. Oh, I am missing one more property, okay? So this is telling the middleware who it is I trust mm -hmm. to tell me who the user is. Right. Okay, here's my information. Right. I only want authentication right now, right. No, no API access. Okay. And this is the information about the user I want. And will they give it to us all at the same time? Yeah, that will all be packaged into the ID token cool. as claims. Okay. So the last thing is, this will deal with all the handshake protocol work with the token server. Nice. Once we come back then, remember I said though, we do have to issue a local cookie. Right. So I need to wire up this middleware to that middleware. Okay. And that's with a property called sign in scheme is cookies. So when you asked earlier about is, is it, the name okay. important? So that's if I important. said Fred, yes. that would need to say Fred. This is Fred, and that's Fred. Okay, exactly. So they line up. Yep. Okay. I think that's all the plumbing here we need. This is going to be exciting if it works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, the one last thing is actually, uh, if I run this now, right now, yeah. uh, I just want to show you what the, the home page looks like. Sure, sure. So we have a really empty MVC this app. This is the default bootstrap? Yeah, yeah, it is with bootstrap, the default code. Um, I got rid of all of the other starter HTML sure, sure, just to, sure. to trim it down. So login link. Right. That says, hey, go get me logged in. So what I'm gonna do is right now on my login link, okay, this doesn't do anything. So oh. that, that would blow up, it okay? Blow up. So what I wanna do is I want to use a method called challenge. What challenge says is challenge the user, which mm. means go get them logged in. Where is that hanging off of? Okay, this is a method from the controller base class in MVC. Really? Yes. Um, it's creating a challenge result object, mm -hmm. so that would be a different way to call it. Sure, sure. And the challenge result under the covers is actually calling a method on the HTTP context. Mm -hmm. uh, context. context. EXT. T, thank you. T, E, X, context. Um, on this thing called the authentication manager, this mm -hmm. is what allows you to talk to the security middleware. All right. And there's a method called challenge. Uh, okay. okay, so challenge is the convenience so, method that's on the base exactly. class controller. So this is like the lowest API, this is a little bit in the middle, and right. then that's the MVC helper. Right. Okay. So it's just easier to... And it knows what how to do challenge because it knows about the middleware that we plugged in. I'm, gonna f I'm actually going to be ex some explicit with my, explicit. my parameters. So there is um, something called an authentication properties that I need to pass. Mm -hmm. And the formatting of this never looks good. And then there's a second parameter that I need to pass. Oh, you know what I forgot? Huh, that's the other thing I forgot. I forgot to name this guy. We named the cookie middleware cookies. Right. I forgot to name the open ID so connect. So that we can refer to it later. So we can refer to it. So this is also authentication scheme, and I'll call it OIDC. That's a common thing. Okay. So okay. that's what I was missing in this other call. So then when you say challenge, it will know which thing to challenge it with. Exactly. So this knows to say, go to open ID connect rather than um, your local cookie redirect, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I, I'm noticing that you didn't just say challenge OIDC, you have to pass in some properties. So, yes. So the last thing in the properties here is once we come back 
from the token server. Mm -hmm. It does all the protocol validation on that ID token. Right. It issues our local cookie. Mm -hmm. We need to take the user somewhere. Ah. And I want to take the user to the home page, this Back index home. page. So there's a redirect URI, slash uh, home, slash index, for example. So if it succeeds, it goes there. If, if it, it succeeds, it fails, yes. what happens? If it fails, there's an exception that is thrown um, in the OpenID Connect middleware. Mm -hmm. uh, and that happens in that callback mm -hmm. URL, mm -hmm. the sign in dash OIDC. And then we could deal with it there. And, yeah, and there, there are actually even events, yeah. So on the middleware, there are events you can handle for error, for error scenarios. All right. OK. So if this succeeds, at the end of the module, work. we will be able to look yes. at the user. <laughs> will we be able to see their, their office? Oh, yes. So the whole point here is that then the index um, action method, if, tell if, them if the user is authenticated, yeah. what we can do is we'll have the user object. Yeah. And, and the, the user, user will be able to see their, their office. Exactly. And the user has a list of the claims. Right. These are the same claims that the token server had. Cool. Okay. So these are the key value pairs. So we'll say uh, uh, var x equals yeah. something. Yeah, and, and so on my view, what I'm doing here, my index page, is if the user is authenticated, okay. what I'm doing is I'm looping. Oh, there's your user.claims and yeah. name value I'm, pairs. I'm looping over these. So we should see all the claims there, and if we do it right, I, office isn't there. I hope so. <laughs> I think it's going to okay. work. So we go here. And if it doesn't work, then it'll have valuable debugging. That yes, we'll learn absolutely. From. Okay, so I'm going to trigger login. Oh, unauthorized client. So you said MVC on both sides. Did we sure we named it the right thing? So we sense? yeah, we went to uh, the token server. We got an error, and mm -hmm. that's why I told you we ran in the console mm -hmm. so I can debug this. I knew I forgot something. So requested scope not allowed profile. Oh yes, silly me. Okay, so what's happening here is let's go back to our config. This actually is a good point to bring up. It's better that it broke. Yes. So in our config. I said, hey, this MVC uh, app can ask for open ID, email, but, but and not office, profile. but not profile. Which so is the larger pile of stuff. It's like, yeah, yeah. a bunch of names. Kind of like something that. we need. Yep. Yeah, it could be. But maybe I don't, I don't want to. Oh, okay? so you can maybe, solve this in two ways. Maybe I don't want to. So yes, I could a grant profile. Right. Okay. Now, the tricky thing about this, which is a, a good learning point, is if we go back to the client app, mm -hmm. did I specify profile? No. no. Did you specify something that implied profile? The default constructor for this actually populates this automatically with open ID and profile. But you're overriding it, though. No, the, this syntax in C-sharp adds to the existing collection. So you that can go, you can go not talk, intuitive. You can go talk to the team about this one. I we, will. we had a little bit of an argument with them That's about this. That's interesting. So yes, what's happening I is would not have guessed that. the constructor for this is adding to the collection, and this so is that a, list, appending to that the collection. That is appends to the list. So how do you clear it? You would have to put this into a into its own variable and, and clear explicitly it clear. That is yeah. disappointing. Yeah, okay. that is. I agree with you. But, I think that's weird. But we got vetoed on uh, GitHub with that. This would have been C Sharp yeah. 7 years ago. Yeah. So we could put profile in here. Well, that's actually redundant. So putting it in the MVC app is redundant because it, it automatically okay. does it. But the point would be, uh, and, and a way I could have discovered that if I didn't know this, I could, like you say, squirrel away the new OpenID Connect options, yep. look at the dot scope and the watch window and go, huh, yeah, exactly. why is profile in there? And that's how I And then I figured the behavior yeah, out. Yeah, exactly. Okay. That's how I figured that out. Interesting. Okay. So good. That's a valuable debugging lesson. Let's right go there. back over here, and we'll add profile. We'll do the happy path to, to, get, to get to get the demo working. Okay, but yeah, we we've talked about the way you could do it the other way. Mm -hmm. Okay, rerun identity server. Cool. And again, th those logs were quite useful. Yeah, they were. Um, so that, they told you exactly. What yes, was wrong. exactly. So now we're going to go back to my MVC app. Rerun my MVC app. Yep. Two five three two six. Yeah. Hit login. Ooh, look at that. Mm -hmm. okay. Now we're now we've just want to point out we went from the MVC app on two, three, whatever point six, and yep. now we're over on identity server, which Absolutely. is giving us the login. Yep. So then you're be Alice or Bob. Right. So um, I uh, so we now have to have to have the user login. This is the thing that's customizable. Mm -hmm. What you do on this page, entirely up to you. Right. Okay. But we're gonna do the simple, you know, Bob. This is the default. Uh, did I do Alice or Bob? I forgot. Alice, I Alice had a, had an office. So I'll pop in Alice here. Alice and Alice. Okay. Okay. Now, the next thing we're going to see is something that is the OpenID Ooh. Connect specification is asking for. Oh. And more and more users are getting used to this. Yes, they absolutely. But you've got a blank checkbox. So there. there are two things. Yeah, my blank checkbox, again, is a typo on my part. Oh, is that's not, okay. uh, that's not the office, is it? It is the office. 
And so what I neglected to do was when I defined office, guess what I forgot to do? Some description. Give it a display name. Display Your name. office. Info. I like these little errors. Yeah, yeah I'm, absolutely. I've decided you're making those errors on purpose. Okay. <laughs> Genius. Yeah, I always forget these little things, but, the, but that, yes. The, that's how people learn, and that's why I Absolutely. appreciate this. So all I have to do is go back. The URL is still up in the browser. Is it still valid? I'm just going to re -ref refresh, and there we Look go. Look at that. Okay. okay. So and I did then, restart Identity Server because it's the in-memory config. And then I assume yeah. that there's something beyond display name, like description, that could give you that additional Yes, so the one down right here is, is a, a okay. lar larger description. If exactly. I unchecked your office info mm -hmm. and said yes, it would just be not in the, in the list. Correct. So this is what's called the consent screen. The consent screen is involving the user right before we go back to the app mm -hmm. and making sure with them if it's okay for the token server that the user has a relationship with, right? Mm -hmm. The token server knows all this information about the user. Right. Is it okay for, for the token server to release this to this MVC app? I, okay. I really like these kind of things. More and more, you know, ever since like, Facebook stopped trying to post on my behalf, right. I really like it when an app tells me what they want to know about me and what they're going to do with it. Exactly. So. Um, this is an important part of the spec as well. Mm -hmm. okay, you so have this, to this, show this. this is, well, you don't always have to show it. So the reason for showing it is typically if the MVC app is third party to the token server. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in other words, you build an app and you're using Google to log in. Google and your app are from like two different companies. I see. Okay. Now, in the case of Identity Server, we do support it, obviously, and it's the default. Oh, but you're logging into yourself from yourself. It's exactly. Your own if the okay. app you're building is from your company and the token server is your company's token server and it's your user database, you're already within a first-party trust boundary. Okay. So you can disable this. So it would be really up to you whether or not you want to Absolutely. give that user your respect or not. Yep. And so in Identity Server, not that I'm going to do this, but I'll just show it real quick. Mm -hmm. This is another example of the flexibility Identity Server has is that we have a require consent false that you can just turn off for that particular client. Nice. Okay. Okay. This is client by client. Right. So you could have three of your internal apps where you disable it, but maybe a third party integrating with you, you leave it enabled. Nice. Okay. Okay. All right. So now this should work. <laughs> I hit yes. Dun, dun, dun. Boom. And now Place. here we are. Where's we are now logged number? in. So what's happening here is the protocol took that ID token. Right. Did all the validation, and it's full of uh, some information about the protocol mm -hmm. and the information about your user. Right. And by default, they're taking all of that and sure. dumping it into your. It's class. everything we know about them. Yeah. So there's a whole bunch of things, like I said, about from the protocol here. Yeah. If we scroll down, yeah, there's subject. Yeah. Yeah. That's the unique ID of the, the user. The unique ID. And we have their name and their given name. That was from profile. Office number came from our office scope. Cool. And there's email. Okay. Look at that. So we are now authenticated. All right. Okay. I feel a, very happy about it's that. It's a bit of a road to no, get there, but yeah. But that that's pretty powerful. So we just took uh, Identity Server, we put it together, we put it in its own ASP.NET host, we put came up with some claims, we did some custom claims, yep. and now we have successfully logged in a user into our MVC app with Identity Server providing that secure token service. We're going to take a break, and we'll come back with even more fun with Identity Server here on Microsoft Virtual Academy. Hey friends, we are marching forward with Identity Server here on the Microsoft Virtual Academy. We successfully logged in. That we was did. awesome. It was good. That was good. But uh, we didn't log out. No, we didn't log out. Um, let's actually show what we have here. So we have login. Mm -hmm. right? We go and log our user in, Bob and Bob. Okay, comes back. Yeah. And we have Bob. That's great. All right. But right now our logout button doesn't do anything. Okay. And again, much like the one that we had before, if I go back to my MVC app here. Um, Right now, log out doesn't do anything. Well, ordinarily, when I'm logging out, like I just delete all my cookies. Right, and yeah, I mean, think about that. That's exactly what we're going to have to do. Okay. Right? Um, now, I got a question for you. Mm. How many cookies do you think we have? Uh, two. Two? And why did you say two? Because that's actually the right answer. Is it really? Yeah. Because you put a thing in startup.cs that was like cookie authentication thingy. What? Where? Uh, in slash startup.cs and configure services? In which app, which app though? In the MVC app. In the MVC app, we did, absolutely. So the MVC app, like I said, when the user comes in through OpenID Connect, once that handshake is done, right. then we issue a local cookie at the MVC app. Right, so, and you said sign-in scheme, which is really which the is using this line guy. 37s. Yeah. And that's the cookie that ASP.NET created. I, don't even, I haven't even seen that. It looks like we should probably look oh, at yeah, it in that's F12. Good point. So we do, if I hit F12 here, we can go look at that guy under application. Okay. We go to cookies. We go here, and we have this cookie. 
Okay. That the standard that's, ASP.NET. That's format. the one that MVC and issued. It's named okay. dot cookies because you called it cookies. Exactly. Okay. okay. Now, it, because we're b running both on localhost, this is actually leaking a little of information. It's kind of going to help you answer the other question, mm -hmm. which is we do have another cookie. Okay. That cookie comes from. What do you think? From the identity server. From identity server. So itself. if they were on different domains, then it would have a. It wouldn't. It wouldn't appear in the it list. It wouldn't like appear, this. but it would. You would still have the two cookies. That's a good okay? point. Now, the really important thing about that cookie at identity server is that's the magic behind single sign-on. Oh, that's a good point. So if I went to MVC application B, yep. a totally different application, the second app, and I'm already logged in, I would expect that it would bounce over and bounce right back and yes. be like, I'm already there. And so we can actually show that. Okay. Okay. So let's go actually show that real quick. So what I'm going to do is to sign you out of the MVC app, there's actually a method very similar to this one called... Oh, I know what you're going to do. You'll remove my MVC application so the app will think it's signed yes. out. Then when I hit sign in, I remain signed in to the security token server, so it'll bounce me there and I'll... Exactly. Just work. Yep. And we've seen that when we log into Twitter, we log into Facebook or Google, and then an hour or two later, another app wants that. We yep. do a little dance, and, and we log in. And you just come right back in. Exactly. So if I rerun this. Oh, I'm starting to realize the challenge. My MVC <laughs> app is can't delete cookies from another domain. It's going to have to request that yes. someone delete them on its behalf. Exactly. So we'll, oh we'll do that here in a second. So oh we are right. signed in. Okay. okay. So right now when I do log out, okay. given the way that I just wrote this code is I triggered sign out. It's very okay. much like challenge, but kind of the opposite. Right. right? Um, and it is specifically right now just talking to the cookie middleware in the MVC app. Okay, so okay. by putting cookies there, it's impl implying cl clear out those cookies, delete those it's cookies. It's deleting, um, it's telling that particular security middleware to clean up, whatever mm -hmm. that means. For cookies, it means right. get rid of your cookie. Cool. Okay, so yes, when I click this, log out, great. Oh, look what I forgot to do. Redirect. Okay, yeah, I should have done a redirect. Um, but you did. Oh, I do have a redirect URI. I think there's a little um, bit of a snafu here for what I'm doing. A little race condition there? Uh, no. I'd have to think about what this is doing under the covers. Let me show it the long way, because I know that that definitely works, which is unfortunately a little bit more. Okay. So there's a slightly different version of this, which is you could do await HTTP uh, context dot authentication dot sign out. Aren't you not supposed to be poking around okay. inside of HTTP context? Well, the HTTP context exposes this property called authentication. Mm -hmm. It's called the authentication manager, and it's what allows your app to coordinate and talk to the security middleware. Okay. So that's actually by design. That is OK. OK, that. yes. OK, that's good to know. Um, so I'm going to sign out of cookies here. OK. okay? And then I'm going to do a redirect back to you know the home page, for example, which okay. is the, the one up there. OK? So I'm going to bring the syntax back in a minute. Off the top of my head, I'm actually not sure what, what, what's happening under there. So. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's run this and see if this guy works. Okay. Okay, so we are log in. Okay. Yeah. So actually, did you notice what just happened? Yeah. Yeah. It bounce, bounce, and then it was logged in. Yeah, I wasn't even prompted. That's because you deleted your cookies cookie, but not your OIDC cookie. Because you can't. From because, the token server. Because the token server uh, issued that one. Exactly. And it, while you, let me guess if I guess, while you might be able to think you get it to work because you're both on local hosts, it won't work in production. Right. It can't so work. The protocol's designed for those things to be running on different domains or you know, can run on different domains. Right, right, well. So that's exactly the problem that you were foreseeing is that when I need to sign out everywhere, mm -hmm. I need to send my user back over to the token right. server. Well, okay. I'm imagining that someone who, who hadn't read the spec, who hadn't thought about it, who hadn't spent time with us here on Virtual Academy, would hack something together to delete all their local host cookies and then freak out when it didn't work in production. Right, and you obviously don't want to do that. No. So that's why there are specifications for this. There's actually a sign out specification mm -hmm. uh, as part of the, the suite of specs. Cool. OK, so log out right now is just getting rid of my local cookie. And again, if we click this, we just pop over. It was actually pretty quick. That's that everything's cool. local. But yeah, we quickly went over to a token server, and it immediately returned us. So log out, you usually don't just want to log out of the app. No. You want to log out of both, OK? So that's why. Um, I'm going to put the other syntax back because I actually prefer it. Yeah. I'm starting to think this is more complicated than we realize. Yeah. I know when I've tried to log out of larger systems like um, you know, Windows Live ID, and it goes and it, it, it says logging you out of, and then it gives you a list mm -hmm. of all of these different yep. clients that it's logging you out Absolutely. of. Absolutely. It can take so some time. So the, the, the joke in the uh, you know, identity space is that signing out is harder than signing in. Wow. Okay. 
All right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to list that I want to trigger both middlewares to sign out. Okay? Uh -huh. So what I want to do is sign out of cookies for within the app, mm -hmm. and I also want to trigger sign out of the OpenID Connect thing, okay. which basically is this guy, which means we're going to have to send the user over there somewhere to sign out. Is there a okay. well-known place that it'll just know how to go there? That's a good question. So if we go back to the discovery document that we talked about before, right. check it out. There's another well-known endpoint ah. called the end session endpoint. Okay, cool. And so that's the endpoint that is um, implementing the sign out specification that I mentioned a few seconds ago. Okay, cool. Okay. All right. So if I rerun that and I rerun, do I have identity server running? It is. Okay. So we're going to go log in now. Bob and Bob. Okay, we're signed in. Okay. Now when I trigger log out, hopefully, ah, oh. look where we are now. Okay, so it's bounced us over there, and we are sitting on log out. So we're now actually back over on 5000, which okay. was identity server. And they're giving us a second chance. Okay. So the I reason see there's no no there. <laughs> <laughs> so they are giving us a second chance, um, and the reason for that is if you think about this discovery document that I talked about in this mm -hmm. end session endpoint, it's a well-known endpoint. Right? Mm -hmm. So what that means is imagine um, your competitor mm -hmm. puts a hidden iframe to this end session endpoint of your company's token server. That would be super mean. Okay, so what would happen is your, your users are using your website and they happen to go look at your competitor's website and they are denial of servicing your users if this automatically logged the user out. Oh, wow. So Which means that anyone could log us out of Twitter or yeah, Facebook yeah, and really just wreck havoc. So that's why on the sign-out page, we need to make sure that the user is really intending to do this. Okay. Okay? So we can hit yes, and now we're logged out. Okay? Are we really? We don't have our cookies anymore. So if I go to the cookies, they're gone. All right. Okay. And this is just an anti-forgery cookie. This is an anti-forgery cookie from the MVC Unrelated. App, which is, yeah, you kind of get that for free. That's cool. Yeah. All right. Now, there are a couple things about this. Is A lot of times people complain, I don't like the prompt. Okay? Yeah, I can see that. And my user now is dead on the token server, and they have like no easy way to get back to the app. Yeah, I'd, want, came from. I'd want the token server to redirect them. Right. But then do I make them click again? Right. So here's the trick, is that to remove the prompt, what we need to do is, because we don't want this denial of service style of attack, right. so we need to, in essence, authenticate the request to sign out. Okay? So that sounds so bizarre, right? But the idea is that oh, I want the... I, no, it doesn't. You're right. I want to make sure that... I, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a claim. I want to know, do you have the rights to be logging someone out? In a sense, Are you yeah. really you? I want to make sure that the request to hmm. sign out came from the legitimate MVC app that we had previously logged the user into. And not just some random get. Not just some random competitor's website. Right. And, 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 and from a RESTful perspective, you don't typically want to take major actions on a get. <laughs> that as well. Yes, absolutely. So what we need, and what the protocol allows us to do this with, is we need the MVC app to pass something to that sign-out request that proves that we had previously were the app that received the login. Right, something okay. verifiable. Something verifiable. Do we have anything in this protocol that's verifiable that we talked about? Well, we have all the claims of the scopes that we pulled from before. But if you just put the pass those as query string parameters, would those be verifiable? Uh, I remember seeing a nonce go by, but I don't know. Yeah, that, but that was a random number. Okay. Uh, and that it's a... Uh, then I'm at a loss. No. Well, what did our MVC app receive in the first place to prove that the identity of the user was Bob? The initial token? The yes, JWT? the ID, ID, identity token. Okay, so we okay. just return it back. So what we're going to do is at sign out time, pass it back. Because we've been hanging, hang, hanging on to this this whole time. Actually, we haven't been hanging on to it. Oh, we didn't. Okay. We received it, but we never put it anywhere. Yeah, what we did is we took the ID, or what the middleware did, is it right. took the ID token and converted the, uh, read all the claims and put those into the cookie, mm -hmm. but it threw away the ID token. So what we want to do is save the ID token. Are we saving it in a cookie? Okay. So, um, yeah, it has to put it somewhere, and the only real state management location that we have so far here is in the cookie. Are we in danger to having two, three, four K of cookies? You are absolutely in danger of that. Okay, so... That would, have, that would have been bad in the 90s. Is that yeah. bad today? No, it's still bad today. Okay. Um, mobile browsers are notoriously aggressive about not allowing um, cookies usually more than 4K. Oh, wow. Okay. okay. So, yeah, they're pretty, um, it's a serious problem, you know, oh. for your app. So, 
in uh, so what's going to happen is this original ID token mm -hmm. will be now stored in the cookie. Okay? okay, it's actually not stored as claims. There's like this dictionary that also lives in the cookie. And uh, my my view that I showed you earlier, where mm -hmm. I was showing you the claims, mm -hmm. I'm actually programmatically. Uh, reaching in and saying, oh, hey, do you have that ID token? Mm. So there's actually an API that you can query to say, give me back the ID token. And so I'm showing it here in the UI if, mm -hmm. if we have one. Um, but yes, the cookie size is a concern. So the authentication, the cookie authentication middleware has a, um, uh, an extensibility point where you can take over ownership of the storage. Mm -hmm. So in other words, what goes into the cookie is just like a GUID, mm -hmm. right? And then, you know, something... Um, um, right. Something small, sure. And then you implement some server-side storage where you put all that other data. Redis, SQL exactly. Server, exactly. God forbid, sessions, yes. whatever. So that's uh, and we're not going to do that here. So I don't think we're going to hit the limit of our cookie size. But this will be good enough to. When you to say show. it's a concern, this is one of the things that I just I deal with it if I'm dealing with maybe perhaps older Android phones and I'm starting to notice that this is a problem in my testing, then I would implement an interface to. To deal with this exactly so it's something you run into then you'll you know okay. or if you know about it ahead of time you might proactively you know kind of uh, mm -hmm. address the problem are, are we gonna have an issue on our desktop browsers um, the, depends you could actually end up if you um, well with localhost it's very easy to have lots of test of course, apps and, of and hit and I, I believe around 16k mm. I, I don't remember exactly but there's a certain limit where the web server will stop Accepting because you have too much, too many headers that are being sent. Okay. So, but yeah, so you might run into it. You have to take action at that point. Okay. Okay. So let's try this one more time. And when we log in, okay, great. So we now have the ID token. So that's the original um, identity token um, that we had gotten back from the token server. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is at sign out time, um, the other complaint that I had mentioned mm -hmm. is that we want to remove the prompt. Right. And now by, by including this token, when I trigger sign out, it will automatically pass the um, ID token for me. So you set save token, which means that you're automatically going to serialize that and save mm -hmm. it into a cookie. Where are you pulling that back out? When I trigger open ID connect sign out, oh, the middleware, middleware knows already it. knows how to do this. That's so it, very convenient. it does it for you. That's okay. very convenient. So the other thing I want to do then is once the user uh, has bypassed the prompt, mm -hmm. I want to give the user a way to get back to my app. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's also a way to do that, and that is done um, by configuring another U configuration option in Identity Server. So what we have is the OpenID Connect middleware or the OpenID Connect protocol allows that when you trigger a sign out to the token server, you can pass along this thing called the post logout redirect URI, mm -hmm. which is the URL where the user is allowed to come back to afterwards. Mm -hmm. So again, this is another thing that the middleware is already implementing for me. So sign in callback, that's the, the hard coded path. All right. Okay. So you have to teach identity server about a little bit more about your client's capabilities with that configuration mm -hmm. option. I suppose one could See a, see a world where it knew that it was ASP.NET on the other side and it knew that those were well-known locations. Yeah, possibly. I mean, you could always provide an abstraction on top of this mm -hmm. to pre-configure these for you because you know you're in, you this, yourself, in yeah, this more closed system of all just MVC. Now, you're hard coding local host, you know, colon, whatever. That can yep. come out of configuration of your Absolutely, own. absolutely. Cool. Okay. All so right. let's go back to my MVC app. Let's try it one more time. So we'll log in. So our user gets logged in, Bob and Bob. Okay. And then when we log out, oh no. We got an error. It didn't behave so the way I expected it well, to. Well, let's see. So we're going to go check the error. I saw invalid here. request. Yeah, invalid request. The, I'll scroll up here and see if I can get anything more about this. Looking for red. Yeah, we are looking for red. And I don't think that's in here. So. The invalid request, we go to the consent screen, identity server's logging out, sign in, uh, end session. So here's the request that came in, mm -hmm. the post logout redirect URI, local host, sign out. Ah, you know what it? I What's that? I have a typo. 
So uh, identity server here is, uh, it, we're getting all the logs about the request into identity server. Mm -hmm. And identity server, this is coming from the browser when we went right. to trigger session. session. And so notice the post logout redirect URI. The middleware is actually passing sign out callback OIDC. And you know what I fat fingered? When I copied that sign setting. Sign in yes. callback. So this needs to be sign out. Which gets to the point that I now apparently presciently was <laughs> teasing you about was keeping track of those is yeah, challenging. Yeah, absolutely. Good to know. Now obviously here with Identity Server, because you might be using a PHP client or a Java Could client, it needs different. to be all configurable. And that's another really important reminder here is that even though we're working on the Identity Server, and Identity Server is an ASP.NET Core application inside of a host, its clients could be from anywhere. Because we're talking protocols. Right, because you're non-denominational exactly. in your technology choice. Okay, run this one more time. Okay, we'll start over, and hopefully if we finally got this all lined up. We'll log in. Bob and Bob. Good. Now when we log out, hey, there we go. All right, so it bypassed the prompt, mm -hmm. and now we give the user the ability to say, oh, yeah, sure, now I'd like you, to go back to the you application. You don't want to avoid that that last click because you do want to let them know that they are logged out and leave them so in that state. So that's typically good practice, mm -hmm. right? You're going to let the user know, yep, everything's good, you're logged out. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, if you really wanted to, you could write some code around that to maybe dynamically detect that the page is fully loaded, mm -hmm. and then once it's done, you can go back. But yeah, um, so there's some, you know, some options there. For cool. You. So we've got log in working, we've got log out working. Yeah. It'll log them out of all, if I, if I log them, it'll log them out of all clients, right? So it actually is not right now. Mm -hmm. That's actually one more step. Ah. Okay. So imagine um, if we do this, let's say we go back to our, our app over here, log right. in, Bob and Bob. Okay. So let's say the browser on the right, you're in app one. Sure. Okay. So the browser on the left, let's say we're in app two. And in app two, we trigger sign out. Right. Okay, so we're going to do the end session request, and I'm pretending I have sure, a client sure. over here, so I get prompted. Okay, yes, we're logged out. Over on the right, though, that would mean my cookie's gone, right? Well, if oh, I hear, if but I hear, your, which cookie is gone? Right, the cookie in the MVC, you know, MVC client one. Your MVC one. cookies, that one, right. is still around. The it's, one that says that you have a session, a live right. session. Because right now, when you come to sign out, through a different path other than the MVC app, mm -hmm. how is Identity Server pinging the yep, other app? That makes okay. sense. And and since this one already has the token that allows it to continue, it's issued by MVC app. Mm -hmm. While it may not have the OIDC one, it doesn't need it because it's not looking at it. Only the token yes, server exactly. looks at it. Yes, exactly. You, once you did the initial handshake with the token server, you're kind of like done with it because mm -hmm. you're just now dealing with your own cookie that you control. So w would would you have to implement custom code identity server where it would enumerate all clients and request logouts from each of them? So guess what? There's a specification for this. So they, they thought of everything. They've absolutely thought of that. Okay. Now, the interesting thing about the spec is that the way that the uh, STS can communicate back to all the different clients that the user is logged into. It mm -hmm. needs some way to do that in the context of the user's, you know, browser session. Some brilliant use of web services I haven't thought of? Yeah, well, not quite. So the spec is written a few years ago, and they've taken their prompt from actually some of the older security specs. Okay. So they use one of the hackiest uh, technologies that the web has had for a while. Uh-oh. And? iframe an iframe exactly oh, man. like multiple iframes and then they like <laughs> bounce from iframe to iframe they don't bounce from iframe but they do multiples in parallel oh wow okay so That's i can i can show that to you modern asynchronous well, so uh, the thing is, though, when the specs were written, they didn't want to take a dependency on things like um, AJAX calls because it would involve mm, cores, and cores was still not quite well enough supported at the time. And it so sounds anyway. like even though we don't like iframes, they're not going anywhere. No, and then they they actually do work reasonably well. Okay. Okay. So the iframe is where you go and and inject in the logout requests to all of the different right. involved so parties. Right. So as uh, uh, an app um, sends the user to sign in in the token server. Mm -hmm. The token server keeps track of its app one and app two and app three, mm -hmm. okay? When the user then comes to the token server to sign out, it has remembered this, and for each one of those apps, it will render uh, on the signed, the logged out page, it will render an iframe for each one, okay? okay? You have to then teach the token server about this iframe sign out URL, okay? Fortunately, in the MVC app, the Microsoft middleware already handles it for you. That's you nice. You just have to write the configuration. 
I have to say that I, I am impressed somewhat, uh, <laughs> somewhat. that that the the Microsoft middleware is providing it what you needed. Like you would, I would have expected that there would need to be dependencies on identity server or custom stuff that you need to write. But because you are doing, you've built a framework that can live in the secure in the in the, in the secure token service, mm -hmm. and that the Microsoft people have you know embraced OIDC and the various specifications that they need right. to do, and have made a decent implementation of that. That you're really just pointing. Uh, identity server to these things, and it's doing its job. Yeah, no, it's, you didn't it's, have to work around anything. It, it is working well, and again, that's again the benefit for the specs, right? You, you're leveraging those. Cool. Okay. Um, so there's another property here called logout URI. This is the intended to be the iframe uh, endpoint, mm -hmm. and the Microsoft middleware implements that path. Okay. Okay. So we'll rerun identity server. Good. We'll rerun my MVC app. Good. And so over here in my MVC app, mm -hmm. we will trigger a sign in. Okay, Bob and Bob. Good. Over here in Identity Server, we see that they're signed in. Here, we have Bob. Nice. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the end session endpoint, like we've mentioned. Okay, we'll log out of Identity Server. And now over in the right side, hopefully if it all worked, I hit refresh and look at that, no more cookie. So there was okay. hidden iframes in there. Yeah, we can even take a look at it here if I run the... Uh, so you didn't th th didn't have a dependency on JavaScript? Nope, this is the whole point, it's an that iframe. That is the whole point. Yeah. So when we look at the you are logged out page, oh. if we drill down enough here, there you go. it actually is an iframe that contains uh, the list of iframes. Oh, wow. But if we actually drill down, here it is. So here then mm -hmm. is that yep. sign out IDC, OIDC uh, pointing to the MVC. And then app. it passed in that token from before? It actually passed. So again, this is also a well-known endpoint. Right. So you don't want attackers That's my next automating question. that. Right, right. So the way the spec um, authenticates to that endpoint is they pass what's called the session ID. So the session ID um, is a unique ID that the user is assigned at login time, mm -hmm. and the MVC app um, holds on to that. That, okay. was in the, that was in the original ID token. And without that, then hitting that is a no-op. Exactly. You should reject it. Nice. Okay. Yeah. They have thought of everything. Yes. Yep. Okay. Let's sign up. All right. Cool. Okay. So the one last thing I wanted to show was um, enhancing the login process, and we'll do it very quickly here, but the idea is that um, the login page is where you get to customize this with however you want the user to log in. Mm -hmm. Right now we're doing a simple username and password, which is, we call those local accounts, right? Those are local to your, uh, your identity server, your token server. Mm -hmm. But you might want to support business partners who want to do authentication, your employees with Azure Active Directory, or social logins with Google. Right. Okay? So you can stick all of that within Identity Server. Absolutely. Being able to log in with a local login or optionally a Google and combine or them is anything. super yeah. useful. Absolutely. So the way that works is because Identity Server is just an ASP.NET application, mm -hmm. your ASP.NET application can simply be a OpenID Connect client to those upstream identity providers, mm. okay? So in other words, the same mechanism that we have the MVC app talk to Identity Server, right. Identity Server can talk to something else. And it become a chain of trust? It is a chain of trust, yes. Hmm. Okay. So uh, just real quick to show this here, um, what I'll do is in my Identity Server host, I fortunately have some pre-configured code here. So what I have is two examples of um, Google middleware and OpenID Connect. So what I'm going to add to my pipeline here is, um, let's see here, I'll pop these guys in. That is a scary block of code. This is. Uh, Should I fear that block of code? Well, this is the OpenID Connect middleware that we had talked about before. Okay, so this is the built-in Microsoft use Google okay. authentication. So yes, right? I'm adding two middlewares because I want my users to be able to use Google right. or um, some business partner's right. identity system. Anyone's okay. generic open ID right. connect. And so what I have here is um, for the for Google, we all understand how that works. Right. For you went the, off into a, just to be clear, you went off into Google, you logged in, you set up an app, you brought in your client ID and your yeah, secret. Exactly. Okay. Um, and for the open ID connect. What we have is we actually have another copy of Identity Server hosted up in Azure for demonstration purposes. I see. It's so it's a hosted Identity Server where that is playing the role of your business some partner. third party 
Right. Open ID Connect business partner. Exactly. So that's exactly. So it's, remember the authority property we said in our MVC right, app? Right, right. The authority here now is our demo identity Okay, server. so we have our MVC application mm -hmm. talking to a, a, a separate web application, which is our local instance of identity which server. Which is your company's my company's, security token service. The one that we built and we own. Exactly. It's RSTS. Yes. How it's be powered by identity server. And it can then chain its login and its web of trust to other partners that use OpenID Connect. We'll be using a hosted version of identity server, so yep. a second identity server. Exactly. Or Google or Twitter or Facebook or whatever. Exactly. Very okay. cool. So if I have my, my canned configuration correct here, then what's going to happen is when my user... The flexibility is starting to really shine at yes. this point. So I run my MVC app, uh, I go log in, mm -hmm. and now on my login page, Ooh. my, well, your, your company's custom login code now right. is detecting that these are also options mm -hmm. to pop in here. And then you give the user a choice, you know, a chance to pick one of them. How would you decide, for example, if a certain Google login is Bob or that uh, a certain Google login has abilities like, like you know, Brock logged in and now he's an admin. Right. So that's a very important um, uh, architectural decision you have to make. Mm -hmm. Usually what you have is at your identity server, you have your database of all your users. Mm -hmm. Okay. Including, you have a record for all your users, including sure. the ones coming from Google and including the ones coming from maybe your business partner. Mm. So what's going to happen then is when you choose one of these external providers, mm -hmm. they will send you back an ID token if mm -hmm. they implement OpenID Connect. Right. It'll have that external system's unique ID for the user. Right. You have to then map that external system unique ID to your user's unique ID. Mm -hmm. okay? And that's all to, up to your login code. Mm -hmm. So that's code you do have to write. Okay, and you have to understand that there's some me mechanics in doing that. Sure. Okay. Mainly, let's say Google gives you a unique ID for the user. Sure. You Usually your email. Yeah. Uh, well, no, it's actually a random, big, oh, really? long, random oh, string. Okay, I must okay. be thinking of this wrong. So Google gives you a unique, random, unique ID. Okay. But it's the same ID every time for every that time. user. Okay. You don't want to take Google's ID and then issue it to your apps. Right. Okay. You want to issue whatever you would have ordinarily issued. Exactly. It's, let's say the user also had a username and password. You want to make sure that's the ID that you issue. Right. Okay? So what we're doing by putting all this logic of finding the Google, mapping the Google user to your user, we're putting this in our token server, you're abstracting all of your apps from that. Okay. Your apps don't have to deal with any of this stuff. They're just going to get a consistent, unique ID for your user. Could you get into complicated kind of workflows where someone could say, I see that you just tried to log in with Google. You used your email, the same email as a local user. Would you like to link these two? Absolutely. And, if that's, and you have to write those. Yes. If, and if those are your requirements, um, then you can implement that logic. Because I think we've all had that experience where we've you know, picked a social game or worked with a, thing, a website where uh, we logged in with our email before. Mm -hmm. One day we arrived and they had just implemented social login. Mm -hmm. And we said, oh, cool. Right. I'd much rather log in with Google. We log in with Google and it says, hey, I've detected. Yes. And we're always impressed by that. Right. That's from a user experience perspective, that's a really impressive experience. Right, yeah. That's I mean, now possible. Yeah, absolutely. But again, you still have to write you the code. You have to write it. And that's totally understood. if your requirements like want that to be a scenario, sure. then implement them and you can do that. Very yeah. cool. Okay, so one of these should work. I'll pick Google. Uh, I think I'm already logged into Google, so that should just immediately right. come and back. Right, your consent. And so now, so I already went to Google and immediately came back. Okay, because in this, you're already I'm already into logged into Google, and because I've done this demo a couple times, the consent I gave at Google mm -hmm. to tr issue the identity to this identity server was already in their database. So there would have been two consents. Google would you, Google would have said this application is interested in you. Yes. And now the application is requesting it from identity server. Exactly. Yep. But right. th that's again if it's third all sure. third, third but party. But again, if you had removed the consent as we saw earlier in the mm -hmm. in the. Uh, in the academy that we could do that, you would have only seen the consent from Google and then you would have come all the way through and been logged in. Yes, exactly. And, and there's your name at and the top. And Google um, remembers that in the future so that if you ever log in again, mm -hmm. it doesn't bother probably. So then you could go over into your Google list of apps, revoke this app, we could. and you'd be all set. Absolutely. Yep. Very cool. So Identity Server could also do the same thing. Part of Identity Server, if you do have consent, mm -hmm. you know, you can do the remember consent here and right. the same kind of database could exist at Identity Server to remember future logins don't have to get re reprompted for consent. Okay. That All right. Nice? That's cool. So we've got log in, we've got log out, we've got really true log out of everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> we've got an, an 
a chain of trust where we can go and have our identity server log into another identity server like a partner or log into social. We used Google in this example. Uh, we'll take a short break and we'll come back and then our MVC application will call a web API on that user's behalf. Thanks for hanging out with us here on Microsoft Virtual Academy. All right, friends, we are back. We are in the final module of the Identity Server at Microsoft Virtual Academy, and Brock has brought us through this, this epic <laughs> journey where we've done login and logout, and now we have the ability to have this application talk to our Identity Server, gets its token. Now we're going to go and call out to external web APIs on that user's behalf. Exactly. All right. That's the next step. Let's do it. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, when you first have your client app communicate with Identity Server, just for authentication, you're getting one type of token called an identity token. Okay. And the intended recipient is the MVC app. Okay. So the MVC app trusts the identity token. Okay. Right? Then we now want to call the API on behalf of the user, as you said. There's a new type of token for that called an access token. Cool. And the access token is where uh, is what's used at the web API. Mm -hmm. um, so the web API is the recipient of the access token. Do I tell the web API my identity token and my access token, or do I just need the access token? No, that's the exact reason I was pointing that out, is because those are distinct tokens for distinct audiences. Okay, so let me ask this dumb analogy. Mm -hmm. I go into the DMV, I show the person at the front desk my identity. Mm -hmm. That then allows me to pull the little uh, token with my number that they're going to call later. Okay. So I've identified myself, yep. which that has then allowed me to pull the number, which at that point I moved past that front desk lady, right. and now I'm inside the DMV, I am authenticated, and I sit around and I wait for that token. Right. I don't have to show my ID again, I just hand them my number when I get to yeah, the next in a step. Sense, in a sense, that's exactly what, what we're talking about here, because you've gone and issued your, you've, you've, you've provided your username and password at the token server, mm -hmm. and it's giving you then something else, mm -hmm. which is um, enough of a proof of your identity and that can be used at the you know, API in this case. How long can it use? Is it per web, a web app? It can be saved? All configurable, mm -hmm. okay? but the access token usually has some sort of lifetime, okay. uh, and the intent is that you have to periodically go back to the token server to get new access tokens mm -hmm. to make sure you're still allowed and, and that the app is still legitimately uh, allowed mm -hmm. to act on your behalf. Okay? So there are some lifetime management issues um, that you mm -hmm. do have to consider. How granular and how thoughtful do I need to be about this? Is it a token to let me access this web, a web API, or is it a token to let me save data versus a token to let me read data? So the granularity of the token mm -hmm. is really up to your design. Hmm. Okay. So um, Google, for example, they have lots of different APIs. Mm -hmm. They have like a calendar API. Right. Okay? And so um, when you uh, write an app that uses the calendar API on behalf of a user, mm -hmm. when you go, uh, when the, 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 the app goes and, and asks for tokens, it could ask for the access to the read-only calendar functionality mm -hmm. or the read-write uh, functionality okay. of the calendar. So in other words, th those two things are called scopes. Mm -hmm. That's actually a, a, a term we heard earlier because right. scopes represent the resources that Identity Service is protecting. So the new type of scope that we're talking about here is an API scope. Mm. Okay, so that's an overloaded term in the protocols. It is definitely a little bit confusing, but sure. Um, but anyway, so that, that's the point. So you get to design your own scopes. Okay, so that's good. So if I'm building an API for my shopping cart, mm -hmm. I can have, uh, you know, adding something to the shopping cart might be one level. Actually checking out and taking money can be another. It's totally right. business logic type level. Sure, and you could create different scopes for different APIs cool. or multiple scopes with a single API with different access like levels. Like the read-only yeah. read versus exactly. read. All right, that's good to know. Um, so anyway, what we'll do here is we'll go introduce a, uh, a single API because that's uh, what I have here for my demo code. Mm -hmm. We have another project with this web API. Okay. Um, right now, if we look into this, this is, again, a separate hosted web API. Okay. Um, it is using ASP.NET Core. Mm -hmm. uh, but but again, as you had mentioned before, this API or even this MVC app could be written in Java or something else still protected by Identity Server. Mm -hmm. So it just happens that this sample is using ASP.NET Core. Cool. Um, so in our startup code, this again is going to look very similar. Um, this is actually kind of a, a trimmed down sample because we don't have any UI. Right. Okay. We don't need views in our API. It just has straight up uh, MVC, So which we have that. In here, then, I have a simple test controller. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm using you know, attribute routing to say, yeah, that's the test API, and I'm basically just saying, hello world. Cool. Okay? Pretty sophisticated. Yeah, very sophisticated. <laughs> so when I run this right now, and I go to that endpoint called test, mm -hmm. right? Great. 
we were able to hit this through the browser. That's not really the so real place. So this is an unauthenticated one, no claims. Correct. Right now I have no security. All right. Okay. Um, my MVC app then, if I run it, let's go get the user logged in, mm -hmm. just because that will enable the button okay. that shows you calling the API. So we have a little thing here to call the API. All right. Uh, we invoke it, and it's also calling the same the same thing. Okay, okay? cool. And that's the result of that API just dropped into a div. Exactly. All right. Um, no security at this point, though. Okay. So okay. I just showed showing you that it, that it works. That it works. Okay. Now, obviously, how do we secure these guys? You can drop in an authorize attribute, right? That basically says you have to be authenticated to hit the API. But that authorization at this point is still on, up in the air, right? We haven't yet. Yeah, we haven't like actually quite implemented that yet. But what I want to show you is that when I hit refresh here now, we get our unauthorized. Okay, good. Right? So I tried to call the API, but I don't have the right credentials. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I would have to say that I think that people will agree with me that who are not necessarily familiar with the identity space, that authenticating web pages, most people seem to understand it and they get that it's a thing. That, uh, they don't. They they don't understand that how to authenticate a web API. It's not quite the same. Like, we're all used to browsers in the past that have popped a dialog sure. and said, log into Windows, sure. and like basic authentication, digest, we get that. People aren't super clear on how to truly authenticate correctly against a web API. Right, and some of the things we've done in the past are subject to certain types of attacks these days. So having mm. done like basic authentication against a web API, if you're doing it from like the browser and your AJAX code, you might be sus uh, susceptible to uh, cross-site request uh, uh, forgery attacks. Mm. Um, so, um, so yeah, so this access token approach that I'm showing you mm -hmm. is the recommended way to protect web APIs. Okay, this is okay. the, in, in, in 2017, 2018, yes. this is the correct way to do your web right. API. So, um, so great. We have my web API. It's running. We are denying access to the anonymous caller. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, this is again why the the two different tokens have two different audiences. Uh -huh. The user is authenticated to the MVC app, but we don't yet have the token to authenticate to the API. The access token. The access token. Exactly. Okay. All right. So let's go get an access token. So to get an access token, my MVC app has to request it right. from the token server. The way we uh, request it is we're going to change some of our OpenID Connect configuration. Is this a resource? This is another resource. Because mm -hmm. so it's different than a separate app that we would log into. Like you had us log into MVC App A mm -hmm. and MVC App B. This is not a, an a, a thing to log into. Right. Think of the, ide uh, the, the th those are called clients. Basically okay. your UIs. Right. Those are the clients are the and clients. the APIs are different. Okay. okay. So the OpenID Connect plumbing here, what we're going to do is um, the first thing I'll do is I'll add a new scope. So I haven't set this up an identity server yet, so okay. I, I'm starting with the MVC sample. Sure. So what I want to do is I want to ask for access to now API 1, for sure. example. Okay? Named API. Exactly. So this would be some named API. This could be your accounting or human resources API or whatever, however you want to model Makes sense. It. Okay. So, and again, this is where I was saying that the protocol overloads scope mm -hmm. for access to two types of things, oh. the identity information and the API access. Okay. That's again, a bit confusing, but that's, that's the way it good works. Good to be aware of. Okay. Um, so then the last thing I'm going to change here is, remember this response type was mm -hmm. what I wanted back from the token server? Right. And previously it was just ID token saying I only wanted the authentication. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this slightly, and I'm going to say something I want, a code and an ID token. Now this gets into some of the bowels of the, um, the OAuth protocol with um, how um, we obtain access tokens from my server side application, mm -hmm. which might be different than a SPA application, might be different than a native application. Okay. So what this is using is um, what's called the hybrid flow. Previously we were just doing what was called the implicit flow. Right. Now we're using hybrid flow. Okay. Implicit meant we only came in through the authorize endpoint. Mm -hmm. Actually, is identity server running here? So remember I mentioned the, in the discovery document, I mentioned the authorize or the authorization endpoint. Right. That's the endpoint where the user is delivered in the browser. Mm -hmm. So it, there's going to be a UI there. Now that my MVC app also wants an access token, the way the protocol works is that you're also going to have the MVC app programmatically talk to the token server, right. and that's through what's called the token endpoint. So it'll request a token endpoint, not by on-the-glass integration in the browser, but by making a, a, a call. Back channel a back-channel call. Okay. call. And the reason we, we do this, so what, what ends up happening is the, the token server delivers through the browser the ID token that we had before, mm -hmm. and this new thing called a code. Okay. The code is not the access token. Code is not the access token. Okay. The code is delivered back to the server-side MVC app, okay. and the MVC app uses the back channel 
and exchanges the code for the access token. Why the indirection? So the, the, what they're trying to protect here or, or do is minimize the exposure of the access token. If the token server delivered the access token via the front channel, mm -hmm and it delivered the token directly back to the client. That means there are a lot of intermediaries mm -hmm. who may have seen the token. So the protocol is designed to try to minimize that. That makes sense. Okay. So at the expense of an extra round trip. So hybrid means you're using a little bit of one and a little bit of the other. Okay. Cool. So that also, yeah. And it's also interesting that scope is taking a list of stuff, but response type is taking a space separated value. <laughs> yeah, that's just a design uh, choice by the ASP.NET team mm -hmm. when they were designing this middleware. Okay. Okay. Um, so, what I'm going to do here is now that we're using the token endpoint also, the programmatic endpoint, mm -hmm. you need to authenticate there. The MVC app needs to authenticate to okay. the token endpoint. So what's going to happen is the MVC app is now going to be issued some sort of client secret. Okay, so this so is a I'm new thing that the MVC app has to be collecting exactly. in its standard login for preparation to call this web API later. Right. So yes, so what's happening is this allows the MVC app, when it, when it tries to exchange that code for the access token, mm -hmm. it will be authenticating as the MVC app to identity Again. server, but it's not as the user, it's as the app itself. As the app itself. Exactly. Okay? That makes sense. So there's a bunch of security, you know, uh, prevention uh, going on here in terms of, you know, what we're, we're allowing to this. But yes, it's more configuration. But is it, is it that we are logging in twice? We are, we are going to this, the token server once on the screen, once in the browser, yes. and once on the back end, twice, and proving ourselves twice? Yes, all in an attempt to minimize the exposure of the access token. Yeah. Okay? Cool. All right. So what this means, this is the MVC code. So what I need to do in my identity server is change the flow, the, the, the grant type that we talked about, mm -hmm. so that the so that identity, identity server knows it's going to be coming on these two two different endpoints. Will it functionally change the uh, the, the standard login experience? It will still will still go to those same front ends. From the end user's perspective, the interaction through the authorized endpoint, mm -hmm. the front channel, will stay the same. Will stay the same. Okay. Okay. Cool. So I need to issue this uh, app a secret, and again, secret is an awful secret. Um, so sure. you, you should generate a nice 128-bit random number. Now we've seen that this is starting to look. This I feel like our app is starting to look like Twitter or Facebook, yeah, which exactly. give us client IDs and client secrets. Exactly. Just like earlier, we had configured Google, and when you go add your app to Google, they give you a client ID and secret for this very reason. Yeah, this is exactly what Google does. All right. Okay. I'm starting to feel like we're really an identity server now. Yes, <laughs> we certainly are. <laughs> okay. So we've issued a secret. I've changed the flow. Mm -hmm. I also now am requesting a new type of resource. Right, so I need done, to. You've done all of this in the MVC app. Yes, and I now need to go configure all these comparable things in Identity Server itself. Okay, cool. So over in Identity Server, what we'll do is we'll go to the client first. Mm -hmm. We will change this flow to be this thing called hybrid. Okay. Okay. Once you start to learn the common patterns, then these start to become a little bit more second, sure. you know, second nature. Well, I can tell you, I'm significantly less. Uh, freaked out now than I was at okay, the beginning. Okay, good, good, so good. I feel empowered. You need, yeah, you need to, you know, read the specs or have it explained to you or read a book on how these work to know, like, what are your options yeah. and just which one to pick. So I need to now have a secret. So we have a client secrets. Um, what this will do is we can now create a new secret. Okay, and this is where I create the secret. Again, it should be a nice 128-bit random number. Um, we actually do a hashing of this. Because of the one, of the one uh, yeah, of the, of the bad secret. But sure. um, the idea is that the assumption is that this is coming from a database. Mm. Okay. So what we do is we assume that maybe the database gets compromised. Oh. Wow. So I don't want the plain text secret in the database. So we hash it. Okay. Just like you might for a user's password. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so that's why that. that so they are still passing the secret over, uh, but we are not validating against that. We're validating against the hash of that. Exactly. We do the whole standard hashing comparison to make that sure it's sense. the right secret. Okay. And we only do a single hash because it, it should be a nice high entropy password. When you store users' passwords, you actually do this looping of hashing mm -hmm. to um, protect against uh, a brute force attack uh, of an attacker who stole your database. Mm -hmm. um, because we know we're going to use a nice high entropy secret, we mm -hmm. don't need to do a whole bunch of hashing, just a single hash is good enough. That's SHA-256, is that an extension method that you added to string? Yes, it is. It's that's, an extension, uh, yeah, it's an like extension that. method the uh, identity server defines. That's cool. Okay. Okay, so the client secret, I changed the flow, mm -hmm. the grant type. 
And now I need to tell API. Um, I one. need to add uh, API one. So I haven't yet defined API one, but I'll go ahead and because I'm here, yep. add API one to the list of allowed uh, scopes. Okay. So now the last thing I need to fill in is this thing I, I didn't do before, ah. which is the other type of resource that Identity Server is protecting. Okay. So I'm going to create a new API resource. We have a, a convenience constructor to mm -hmm. just fill in the two things that you need, which is the scope name of the uh, API that you're trying to get access to, cool. and then a display name. So this is my you know, demo API 1 or whatever. Cool. Okay. Uh, the convenience constructor is kind of nice, because remember earlier I forgot the display? <laughs> that, that's what this is making sure I, I have. Okay. Does it need to know the uh, location of the API, or does it just need to know its unique name? No, so that's a good question. The, um, the scope, the string right here, is the identifier, the logical identifier for the API. Okay. okay. So we've been using things like secret. We don't use that. We use uh, a, a long number. We've been using names like API1. Mm -hmm. We could use like a, a Java-style namespace like com. You dot. Could? BarackAllen.com, you know, whatever. Yeah, frequently this might be your company, you know, so Acme Corporation or whatever, um, and this is like your HR API. I see. And if you even wanted to do the the read only, um, you know, ver, you know, I, I can put dots in here, like read only versus read write. You can, mm -hmm. you know, it's just a string. As long just as you come up with some scheme that makes sense, so that when there's hundreds of them, yes, it makes yep. sense to everybody. Cool. Okay, cool. So we have uh, we're modeling our API. Oh, and actually, yes. when there are hundreds of them, Identity Server can handle that. Sure, Identity right Server. Right now, can handle you're them. hard coding these API resources. I can put these in a database. Identity Server can maintain access to hundreds of clients, thousands of clients. Uh, of APIs and clients, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, this becomes a bit of a design discussion. Mm -hmm. Remember, I said there's still other things you have to sit down and think about, like session management. Also, scope design is actually one of the more uh, tricky areas when you're designing this. It's like, like, should I design a scope for all my APIs or should I design a scope for every one of my APIs? Mm. And you can get too granular with this. So scopes usually are best as a coarse-grained um, mechanism for modeling an API because fundamentally what this is used for mm -hmm. is to prompt the user for consent. Mm. Okay. So if you have um, a, a, a consent screen with 30 different APIs, the user's not going to know what to say. It's okay? interesting that you say that because when you play around on the Google Developer Console, they have such a large amount of stuff, yes. and it's all different groups. Yes. Even though they've come together in this way with their own identity server and tokens, it looks overwhelming, and honestly, I don't know. Uh, you have to go and individually grant yourself access to right. all these little APIs. Yeah. I really just want a class of API. Well, uh, yeah, and that's definitely the tricky trade-off that you're, you know, the tricky design that you have to, 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 to solve, mm -hmm. okay? Okay. All right, I think I can run this now. There's Identity Server. Uh, go back to my MVC app, run this guy. And I don't know if I forgot anything. It's a really fast laptop. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I guess I'm logged in, so let's go log out and go back. Mm -hmm. Okay, trigger this again. Log in as Bob. Hey, look at my consent ah, screen now. look at that. Okay. So now, in addition to all my identity data that's being uh, requested by the client, by the mm -hmm. MVC app, it's saying, hey, this MVC app also wants to access your demo API awesome. on your behalf. So yes, good. All right. And actually, do you remember that flag I had earlier called save tokens right. that, that held onto the ID token? Right. It also holds onto the access token nice. for us. So this access token, actually what I can do is I can take this and um, there, I can take a peek inside of it. So there's a nifty little utility called uh, on the website called jot.io, mm -hmm. which allows you to uh, peek inside of this. Okay. JWT. JWT. And what this is doing is decoding the jot. Okay. Jots are signed but not encrypted. Okay. So this is just decoding it. Is and this using a specific kind? This isn't just. It doesn't look base sixty four. It looks like something else. It's base sixty four URL encoded. Ah. And then there are sections to it separated by dots. And the first two sections are JSON objects, and the third section at the end is the signature on the rest of it. Okay. Okay. So this then shows you what's inside of the JSON web token. That's so this cool. is the access token, and this has things like, hey, what client obtained the access token? What user, that's the subject identifier, right? Remember, that's the unique ID of the user. Mm -hmm. This is the subject identifier. Um, that uh, is a unique ID for the user. So when you call the API, mm -hmm. you'll know which app was using you and which user it was on behalf of. Very cool. Okay. 
And the last thing in here is the scope. This basically says, hey, this is good at API 1. You could build um, two scopes uh -huh. and have the MVC app get one access token that could be used at both scopes. Oh, right. okay, right. So that's a possibility as well. All right, cool. Anyway. Now I'm starting to think about when you hit call API, I don't remember us plugging anything yeah, in. Yeah, we haven't to, done anything yet. No? So if okay. we call this, it'll still be it's option. still not using the access we, token. We haven't done anything to pass it along. Correct. So that's a good, good point. Where do you think you would pass this access token when you're invoking the web API? Let's, let's go look at the code for the web API okay. or how we're invoking it. Sure. So down here, I have this little call API helper. Okay. Right. I'm hard coding the, the URL. HTTP client. I use the good old HTTP client, mm -hmm. and I'm just calling get on the, the API URL. Okay. Well, everything that we've been doing has been a lot of well-known this and well-known mm -hmm. that. There's there's a spec and there's agreed upon strings. I'm assuming that there's some x dash something <laughs> header that we would include. So yes, there is a spec for this, and it's called the HTTP spec. Okay. So the mm. HTTP spec defines the authorization header. Really? So you're just going to use the regular We're authorization? We're going to use the good header. old authorization header because that's exactly what it's for. That's cool. I, right. Somehow I thought they'd make a new one, but you're right. Nope. The, well, the, 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 re, the new RESTful world is using verbs that have been around for years. Why yeah. not? Use yeah, yeah. You use all the stuff that's already predefined. And proxy servers already know to not log that kind of stuff. So you don't want to leak these access tokens. Which is interesting. Even though I've been doing HTTP for a long time, a lot of the uh, my understanding of the headers like authorization, it's mm -hmm. been fairly opaque. Mm -hmm. It's a magic string. And I honestly don't know what they're doing to assert that it is correct. Okay. So when I do a basic auth and I get back an authentic, you know, authorization and authentication header, just I don't. Okay, look, magic right. string. You're going to generate one. Well, we and authenticate against it. We how? already generated one here. That's what we passed. Oh, we, so we, that's we, that's the, what goes into the authorization as header. it is. As it is. Ah, and because it's that's a JSON, clean. And because it's a JSON web token, when it's sent to the API, because it has a signature. We can trust. We can trust it. We can and validate it. And we know who it's on behalf. So it's tamper proof. We know all sorts of information about it inside, where it came yep. from, who it was, and whether they have access. Absolutely. So it's very clean. Let's go update our MVC app to then read the access token. So remember, I actually showed you earlier the little bit of the code where you can reach into that dictionary that is in the mm -hmm. cookie. The client. Yeah. And this is the um, get token. Yeah, remember that. This is get token async. So I'm going to copy this real quick. And I'm going to pop this here into my code. So there's my access token. Let me use semicolon. And then on the HTTP client, there's something called the default request headers. Mm -hmm. okay, this is, allows you to configure the headers of the uh, HTTP request. Mm -hmm. There's a property called authorization. Okay. And I'm going to instantiate a what's called an authentication header value. Somebody didn't quite get the names lined up. But anyway, that's <laughs> weird. There's probably some Why isn't it just a string? Right. There's Well, actually, the reason it's, a, it's an object is because the value is actually um, the header. Is There's two values in the header. Mm. So there are two values. The first value is what's called the scheme. And then there's a white space, and then there's the actual credential. I see. So you are overloading one header, but you could pass multiple credential types. Okay. So the credential type that we use for our access tokens is called bearer. And then we put the access token in as the value. So this will actually be sent as the authorization header, the hard-coded string bearer, mm -hmm. one white space, and then whatever that access token is. If, if bearer is such a standard thing and that's such a common thing, it seems like there should be a, oh, an overload or a, a convenience thing to make authentication header value. And the fact that authentication header value doesn't uh, line up with the word authorization, you have, <laughs> well, this is a, you could make a header value helper right. that would have bearer happen for you. So we have one, <laughs> uh, and we can do it that way. Great minds. Okay. So did, yes, we, did I did so, I just make that up? And you already so, had it ready to go. Yeah, yeah. So this this I we, totally didn't know that. We we have another open source library. So Identity Server is one of our open source libraries. We have another open source library called Identity Model. Oh. And that is filling in the gaps that are kind yeah. of missing across all the all .NET, the helper stuff. All the helper stuff that the .NET framework okay. doesn't have. So that means that line 47 and 48 is kind of like the standard low-level way of doing it, yeah. and 46 is the, the I'm equivalent. doing this all day long. I got tired of it. Yes. Here's a helper. Exactly. And what's going on with context? That I'm not sure. This dot context. Oh, HD. Oh, because in the view it's called context, but in the controller it's, HTTP it's called context. HTTP context. So it's yes. hanging off of the base class. My copy and paste wasn't quite it's successful. All, all right. All right. Good. Great minds think alike on yes. that bear thing. Because <laughs> eventually you find yourself doing that multiple times. Yeah, you say that's absolutely. Not cool. 
The thing about the bearer token, the reason they use the word the scheme bearer is because whoever bears the token mm -hmm. can use it. So I think of a bearer token as like your um, hotel, uh, you know, the plastic room card that you get. Mm -hmm. Anybody can use that to put in the door, you know, as long well, as like you... Well, like bearer bonds. Yeah. Right? You well, lose them, someone, that. Yeah, someone yeah, else that got too. your money. So that's, that's where that term comes from. That makes sense. Okay. okay. So this is now going to pass the token, mm -hmm. except we still got one more problem. Because we didn't authorize it on the other side. We actually didn't l even look at didn't it. Didn't look in at the it. API. We ignored it entirely. Exactly. We did put authorize on the top of the uh, web API, but we, I don't think we had a scheme or any. Exactly. So we're, um, yeah, so we, we have the, the denied anonymous access. We're passing the token, but nowhere in the web API is it actually inspecting the token to uh, establish trust with sure. who the user is. And, and I was thinking about that. The, uh, inspecting the token is one thing, but all the validation that one could do, like a lot of people right now will make a call to HTTPS. Mm -hmm. And they assume that that HTTPS transaction, that that this happening over SSL is meaningful. It's just private. There's no proof that I'm talking to who I'm saying I talk to. Very rarely do people take apart the cert and use it for valid validation of identity. Right. Are we going to do lots of different checks on that JWT to determine so, its right. correctness? So, so you're right. With HTTPS, um, there's nothing authenticating the caller. Right. Right. Um, so that's what the access token is providing us with, mm -hmm. is a means to authenticate the caller. Mm -hmm. It's obviously the API knows that it has to be a jot and it is trusting identity server. Okay. And so that's part of your, your trust. Um, and it will look in there for, a, for API 1 and yeah, confirm yeah. that so, it's there. And so the, all of that stuff, you're right. So for the access token to, do valid, to validate it, yes, there are several steps that need to occur. Validating the signature mm -hmm. is a big part of it. We need to make sure that the access token comes from the token server we trust. Right. And we need to make sure that the access token is meant for our API mm -hmm. as opposed to some other API. So it's kind of like the hotel room key. Exactly. I can only use in at one room, hotel. One, well, in one <laughs> hotel, one but room. even one room. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. Good point. So it's audience scoped. Okay. And identity server does that validation for me. Identity server created the token. It's up to your API to do that validation. Okay. Well, so let's see it. we need something in the API to authenticate that. Mm -hmm. And what have we used so far in our other apps to do authentication, right? We've used a middleware, uh -huh. okay? okay? We've used cookie, if the, if the credential is a cookie, we use that. If we're trusting okay. identity server, we use OpenID Connect. So in the web API, there is a middleware that again, I already have the NuGet package um, added for. Okay. Um, I need to add it into my pipeline. Right. It will sit in front of MVC, right. so it gets to see the token before my API call. Mm -hmm. And um, it is called Use Jot Bearer Authentication. Nice. And this, that's yours or Microsoft? This is written by Microsoft. Really? Okay. So um, that's cool. Yeah. So that's already there, which is nice and easy. So we have this. And the options that we have on this thing, we have very similar to what we had earlier with OpenID Connect. Mm -hmm. We have the authority we trust. Look. And are you pronouncing that Jot like J O T? J. OT is the pronunciation of JWT. Of JWT. Exactly. Right. Yeah, that's the official. It even says it in the spec. Seriously? They put quote JOT, JOT. Okay. Okay. So, who do we trust? Got it. Okay. And who are we? Is essentially what these two are showing. All right. Good. Looks good. All right. I'll run this again. And it would be, it would throw forbidden if it didn't fit that. No, what ends up happening is if the token is um, invalid or corrupt or, or um, uh, expired, that kind of thing, then it's almost like a no-op. Mm. So then the call comes into your API as anonymous. Oh. So you still need you the authorized. The same you, still, unauthorized. Yeah, you still get the 401, yes. Okay. okay. So back here, let's refresh and look at yes. that. Yes. Okay. That's pretty sweet. So the call came in to the web API with the JSON web token. The web, JSON web token had all of these claims. Mm -hmm. The bearer token um, authentication middleware validated it, took all the claims out of the payload, mm -hmm. and turned those into claims on the user object in your mm -hmm. you know, ASP.NET code. And so that's how you look in your actual application layer, like, oh, who's, who, who's the user calling me or what app is calling me? Mm -hmm. You just go query that claims collection for the claim you, you know you're looking for. Very cool. Okay. Let's return to the documentation at identityserver.io mm -hmm. and look at that diagram and let's re, re, kind of re, look at what we did today, what our accomplishments are today. <laughs> so yes, here is our big picture for the typical types of applications. 
Oops, that was not what I wanted to do. There we go. There we go. So what we did is we, uh, actually, let me scroll down here. What we did is we set up this security token server mm -hmm. using Identity Server, uh, separate ASP.NET Core application. It knows all about your users, all about your apps, all about your APIs. We then built a server-side MVC application mm -hmm. to connect to that to authenticate the user, mm -hmm. and uh, by doing so, obtained this thing called an ID token, mm -hmm. and uh, was granted the, the ability to call an API on behalf of that user with that thing called an access token. So we basically drew, you know, filled in that picture, you know, part of the, the mm -hmm. picture. So there are definitely lots of other scenarios that we didn't have time to cover. Sure, but you could build a pure JavaScript. SPA style application. Mm -hmm. You could build a native application that also is trying to invoke those APIs. Uh, again, and we have samples up on our GitHub repo for those, um, and we have walkthroughs that walk through, um, you know, setting up code to, to um, mm -hmm. uh, teach you about how to how to design for those. Okay, but anyway, yes, that's uh, that's basically what we covered. Cool. So identity server, you can get it at identityserver.io. Yeah. Now, help me understand, it is an open source project. People can use it, but it's also there's a consulting arm, and you can get training. Yes, you can do workshops so, with you on the identityserver.io website. We list a lot of our our options. We um, we do provide services around identity server. Mm -hmm. So we have. Um, uh, we provide uh, consulting, so mentoring, um, architectural consulting, knowledge transfer, helping you design what you're, you're building. Um, we can actually do a larger uh, consulting, so we can actually help um, build proof of concepts for you, or mm -hmm. even a full blown implementation, uh, and we can transfer you know ownership to your team. Um, and we also provide production support. Mm -hmm. So if you you know come through our consulting and we help you design your system and you make sure you're doing it right, mm -hmm. then we offer. Um, uh, production support options. Uh, we have a three-day training class uh, around Identity Server, uh, and um, we have a couple of um, uh, customer uh, partner companies that are um, helping us build additional um, products on top of this. So one example of that would be um, all the configuration I showed you was mm -hmm. all just hard coded, right? Um, and we do have an entity framework implementation, mm -hmm. but there's no UI for mm -hmm. managing that stuff. So yeah. that's an example of one of the products that we have then on top of this. Very cool. Great example of an open source project and a business behind it. Yeah. Fantastic. So we have learned all kinds of great stuff about Identity Server. You can check it out at identityserver.io and get involved right now with this great open source, OpenID Connect and OAuth 2 framework for .NET. Thank you very much from all of us here at Microsoft Virtual Academy. Thanks.